Uh, I would like to welcome this morning on uh, the Deputy Chair on Telephone, Pam Cameron, and we also have three other members participating by telephone this morning, which is Orlea Flynn, Colin McGrath and Pat Sheehan. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Okay, members, now, we now have the Minister for Health with us this morning. We have no apologies on the quorum. We now have the Minister for Health with us this morning and the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, I, they are here today to update the committee on the COVID-19 crisis. So I welcome to our committee this morning Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, and Chief Medical Officer Michael McBride. Um, could I invite you members then to, we have, we have obviously a lot of questions this morning, your time is limited, so I suppose we're, we're aware that you will have a briefing for the committee this morning, but if we could keep that quite short and we can get then to the questions, I suppose, as quickly as possible. No problem. So welcome yeah. this morning, Minister, and please yeah, come on. Thanks. Thanks for having us again. Um, look, and good morning. Look, I'm conscious that officials are due to brief the committee um, after me in regards to the 1920 budget and the adjustments and also our 2021 budget. So I'll take the opportunity just to update members with the latest developments regarding COVID-19. Um, as I said yesterday when I, I did the, the press conference, it's startling to realise that it's only eight weeks ago today since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 was actually reported in, in Northern Ireland. And I was in front of you six weeks ago at this point, along with the Chief Medical Officer and the Permanent Secretary, when we actually had to leave early, if you remember that stage, um, to go down to brief FMD, FM in regards to um, steps that the Republic of Ireland had taken in, in regards to, to restrictions they were placing. So all of us have been affected by this virus uh, and by steps that we have had to take to contain its spread and mitigate its worst potential impacts. We've seen all our lives disrupted. Uh, limitations on our ability to visit family and friends, or children unable to go to school or to play with their friends, unfamiliar restrictions on everyday activities like going to the shops, going out for a meal, or taking a walk in the park. Many of us have suffered economically due to loss of jobs or slowing of the business. Many of us have had the disease ourselves or have seen loved ones suffer from one. Too many of us have sadly lost loved ones and have not been able to say goodbye to them in the way they would choose to. These past eight weeks have also seen countless daily examples of the quiet heroism, heroism of our health and social care workers as they go about their jobs to keep us all safe. We have also seen our communities come together as never before to look after and support each other. Ordinary people across Northern Ireland have accepted this disruption and uncertainty with good grace and patience and have willingly traded their personal freedoms to buy vital time to help our frontline services deal with the unprecedented challenges they have faced over the past weeks. I, I spoke with you just three weeks ago on the work that is ongoing to manage this emergency, and since then much progress has been made, so it is timely that I now provide you with a further update and to take this opportunity to, to look at what may lie ahead. The first and most important thing I would wish to say is that we are by no means out of the woods yet. In the past eight weeks since the first confirmed case in Northern Ireland, we have seen 2,874 confirmed cases of the disease, and sadly 250 people have passed away. I am aware of the concerns that have been raised in recent days in relation to the reporting of COVID-19 statistics. These daily figures are compiled for surveillance purposes to help us track the virus and keep the public as informed as possible. They will always be subject to some degree of revision as deaths will be officially registered at different times in busy hospitals and other locations. The weekly bulletin produced by NISRA provides a more complete picture of COVID-19-related deaths across both hospital and community settings. But, Chair, every loss of life to this disease is a tragedy and a source of grief to us all. And I want to reassure members and the public that the protection of life remains the overriding concern of my department or approach to managing the pandemic. I want now to take some time to explain the approach that I have adopted to deal with the emergency and to outline some of the significant actions that have been key to, to our response. Testing has a significant role to play in our fight against COVID-19, and I would like to reassure you that testing is growing and will continue to do so as rapidly as is possible. As of yesterday, the total number of individual tests for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland stood at 16,378. 
That figure includes 5,013 health workers, although it should be noted that since we were not specifically testing health care workers at the start of the process, this figure may actually underreport the true number of health care workers tested. On Tuesday, there were 1,112 tests run uh, across the system, and that included 122 as part of the national testing programme. So members will be aware, however, of the difference between individual tests and the number of individuals tested, as many people require more than one swab to be taken. You will be aware that testing is now also carried out at a number of DVLA sites to support local trust capacity and through the national in initiative at the SSC Arena testing site. A second site is now operational in Derry Rugby Club, and from the 17th of April, uh, that was from the 17th of April, and a third site will go live at Craig Alvin MOT Centre. In addition, an expert working group has been established to lead in the expansion of testing across all our laboratory services in health and social care facilities and to consider options for the utilisation of other testing facilities, including those in the commercial sector. In the testing strategy, which has been shared with my executive colleagues and with members here in the Health Committee, I have made it clear that the overall testing policy will be adjusted over time as testing capacity increases and priority groups for testing are expanded. Similarly, the strategy also includes a pledge that testing will soon move towards surveillance of COVID-19 in the population to inform the planning of services, including surge capacity, and to estimate population immunity. Yesterday, you may be aware that I announced a further expansion of testing to now include additional symptomatic frontline workers and members of their household. Importantly, this now includes frontline workers in the private sector with a focus on staff delivering key medical, energy, utility, transport and food supplies. And this will be delivered as we continue to expand the local capacity of the national testing programme. So employees who think they are eligible and need to be tested are being instructed to speak to their employer as and when they need a test. The details of how to be tested will be widely circulated by the public health agency across local industry. This latest expansion in testing will allow even more vital workers to return to the front line. A number of extensive studies on testing will be taken forward over the next few weeks, uh, focused on care homes, general practice and emergency departments. And programmes planned include the testing in care homes, which will begin to enhance and support optimum care for residents and support staff, and inform our understanding of the nature of COVID-19 in care homes. Testing on surveillance in general practice and testing on surveillance in emergency departments. It has also been confirmed that anyone leaving hospital to get back into a care setting will be tested. 48 hours before discharge. Chair, in regards to PPE, I have been clear about the challenges with PPE. COVID-19 is a worldwide issue, and protecting staff and patients impacts as much elsewhere as it does locally. The pressure on supplies are significant globally, and as I have said on a number of occasions, there is not a country in the world that truly knows the path that this virus is going to take. So my aim, along with executive colleagues, is to ensure that we have a sufficient stock of PPE to allow our HSC staff to perform their roles as safely as possible. And that is why I am committed to ensuring that we regularly pursue every viable supply source, both locally and elsewhere. None of us can work on our own in our battle against COVID. So the Four Nations PPE plan was published on the 10th of April, and we are working closely with England, Scotland and Wales on all aspects of that plan. And we have already supported each other by way of mutual aid, and that will continue probably in the weeks and months ahead. Equally, we continue to explore new supply lines with the Republic of Ireland. We have also significantly increased supplies from local agents and local industry, which is to be commended as it continues to show itself to be adaptable, innovative and responsive to this challenging environment. China is the most significant source of worldwide supplies. And the work led by my department and the Department of Finance to secure PPE is important and at a critical stage. We continue to work to ensure all possible steps are taken to open up a supply chain that meets our needs and supports our Four Nations approach. Additionally, clear specifications and photographs will be requested to ensure that stock is compliant with our requirements. I have already underlined the vital importance of distribution and deployment to all frontline settings and stressed that all staff must know where to turn. When they are in their organisations when they have concerns or questions. That is why a new email contact was established for health and social care staff to raise PPE concerns. And the email address will be checked every day, and the anonymity of staff using it will be protected. 
And this is the latest demonstration on just how seriously we are treating staff concerns on PPE. In regards to surge planning, a, a key component in the emergency response has been worked to maximise RHSC's capacity to treat COVID-19 patients. Each trust has taken steps to significantly increase critical care capacity at local hospitals, and further plans are in place to scale up the total number of ventilated care beds as required. Chair, today as we stand, there are 36 COVID patients and 40 non-COVID patients occupying one of 115 available adult ICU beds, and 56 of those patients are undergoing medical ventilation or mechanical ventilation. That means that as it stands, and before even more beds come in line for a further increase in critical care admissions, we have 38 spare adult ICU beds and sufficient stocks of equipment to provide ventilation and other forms of respiratory support. In total, we currently have 197 mechanical ventilators and further orders in place with various suppliers, which would bring the total to over 400 mechanical ventilators if required. We will continue to plan beyond the reasonable worst case scenario. However, for the time being, our latest data modelling indicates that further critical care capacity will not be required during the current wave of transmission in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland's first Nightingale Hospital, located in the tar block of Belfast City Hospital, is a key part of surge plans. The new Nightingale Hospital can treat up to 75 ventilated patients, and that figure can be scaled up to 230 ventilated patients from across Northern Ireland, should that be necessary. In regards to the treatment of non-COVID patients, I stress that much of the day-to-day -day non-COVID business of the health service continues. People are still having strokes and heart attacks, and that is why I urge anyone who suspects that they need to talk to a doctor or present to a hospital to do so. In addition, HSC trusts are now accessing hospitals and the independent sector to treat non-COVID patients across a number of elective specialities. It is expected that up to 135 procedures will be carried out per week across a range of red flag and urgent cases. These will include breast surgery, gynae cancer surgery, plastic surgery, urology procedures, general surgery and optopathology, as well as uh, the potential for a small number of local anaesthetic procedures to be undertaken. The HSC will fund this activity on the basis of compensating the independent, independent sector on a net cost recovery not-for-profit basis. In regards to modelling, key to informing the decisions that I and executive colleagues will need to make in the weeks and months ahead is the work being undertaken by the COVID-19 modelling group. The projections provided by this group are informing the work that needs to be progressed to ensure there is sufficient PPE available, that testing is scaled up, that our hospitals, GP services and community pharmacies have capacity to deal with the demands they are facing and that key services within the community are prepared to deal with the challenges they are facing today and every day, and until this disease has been defeated. Chair, latest modelling would suggest that our health service has a realistic prospect of coping in this initial period if a sufficient proportion of the population continues to adhere to the social distancing and self-isolation measures. The number of deaths during the first 20 weeks, and that is from the 18th of March to the 4th of August, of the epidemic under the reasonable worst case scenario has been reduced from 3,000 to 1,500, and that is based on the continuation of the current measures. While this is positive news, I would reiterate that there are no grounds whatsoever for dropping our guard. Projections underline that the continuous of rigorous social distancing will save many lives and protect our health service from collapse. So even a relatively modest increase in commission could lead to an increase in the number of cases within a matter of weeks. In addition, the absence of vaccine means we will never we will have to plan for future potential second waves of COVID nineteen cases later in the year. So despite the potential for breaches of the rules by members of the public, especially with the perceived confusion about where and how exercise can be taken, Police messaging and tactical deployment of resources appears to have been extremely successful, encouraging most to do the right thing and stay at home. It seems clear to me that PSNI are adopting a, an appropriate and graduated approach to enforcement, providing advice and guidance to those leaving their homes without good reason, and using the threat or the reality of enforcement powers 
is those small numbers of cases where this advice is blatantly being ignored. And I commend the PSNI for this and ask that they seek to maintain this critical element of the response to COVID-19. Chair, in regards to next steps, I very much wish that I could provide some certainty on what the future holds for us all. Modelling has indicated that we are now in the peak of the first wave of the pand pandemic, but it is too early to confirm whether the current figures represent the peak. In the absence of a vaccine, we will have to plan for a potential second wave of COVID-19 cases later in the year, once restrictions are eased or lifted and normal life gradually resumes. While there are grounds for hope that the outbreak can be brought under control through maintenance of the current restrictions, coupled with the continuation of the high level of compliance that has been observed by the people of Northern Ireland, the outbreak has not yet reached the point where some of the restrictions can be relaxed. The progress achieved through good adherence to the restrictions by the people of Northern Ireland will be lost very quickly if there is any adverse change in compliance with the existing social distancing measures or relaxation of some of the restrictions that help achieve that compliance. It is clear that in Northern Ireland, as elsewhere in the world, the restrictions are causing hardship, distress, anxiety and economic harm. They represent a level of interference with family life, work, religious practice, social and cultural activity leisure, sporting and educational pursuits that is alien to our way of life. However, at this moment of time, if we stick firmly to the measures we have, but the time will come for those discussions and we have to face them together, honestly and openly. They will not be easy decisions because simply maintaining the current lockdown indefinitely would have serious repercussions for many people's mental and physical well-being, and that is why we must continue to re review and challenge the regulations we have. We will all have to weigh up our options very carefully, working closely with colleagues across these islands to ensure that we take the right decisions at the right time. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, okay, uh, I, I, I would like at the outset just to acknowledge that, that there has been uh, progress made since the last time we spoke in relation to PPE. There's been additional uh, deliveries of PPE, still many questions and many concerns out there. Um, Testing and ensuring capacity hasn't been exceeded in hospitals, and I think that's, that needs to be acknowledged, and no doubt that that's a result of the tremendous commitment of the entire system. Um, and, and I know that there will be questions arising as we, as we go forward, but that's important to state. A couple of quick things, just if I may. In relation to the figures around deaths, um, what's your, was that a mistake? Was it a, was it a systemic mistake? How did that come about, and what is being done to address that? Uh, Chair, I, I want to be clear, no matter what system or, or what country has been reporting deaths in, link, in, in relation to COVID, they've experienced the same time lag in reporting deaths. So uh, the, the Chief Medical Officer in the Republic of Ireland indicated, I think, in, in his press conference yesterday, that the First Minister in Scotland always prefaces, prefaces uh, her report on the number of deaths that these are not concurrent. There will be a time lag. Um, so the piece of work that we simply did yesterday was to make sure that any that were outlying, we brought them up to date, and as soon as we had that piece of work done, I, I thought it was right that we present them now. Those deaths would have been would have fed into our system over the next number of days, but when they were presented to me um, yesterday due to a piece of work, um, I thought it was right and proper that we made them public at that point in time. So it's not about they were never going to be delayed, it was in the timeliness and the timeline of them being reported. Chief, maybe yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've made this very clear from the outset. We are talking about different things here. The source of authoritative uh, advice and comparison in relation to deaths, uh, either directly as a consequence of COVID-19, or uh, where it's been suspected that there is COVID-19, but that has not been confirmed, and other excess deaths. Uh, because of the things that we've had to do at this present time. That will come from NISR, that's a, a Northern Ireland Statistical Research Agency, that's official published uh, statistics. What we were using uh, is data which actually allows us to track the impact, hopefully the positive impact, and we are seeing the positive impact of the social distancing measures that the public are hearing, adhering to. Um, and the first instance, as I've said repeatedly, that's a fall in admissions. To hospital a fall in admissions into intensive care and then in due course a decrease in deaths. The process of registration of deaths is complicated. 
uh, it's actually more timely in Northern Ireland than in other parts of this island and indeed other parts of the United Kingdom. But there will always be a delay between uh, the death of an individual and those tragic individual circumstances and the completion of the death certificate by the uh, doctor and then the registration of that death. And I'm very grateful that colleagues in NISRA over the last couple of weeks have moved to uh, weekly uh, reporting uh, of uh, deaths and excess deaths, uh, and that includes separating out uh, those deaths where uh, COVID-19 has either been confirmed uh, or indeed is suspected, and again, they will be publishing that data again uh, tomorrow. And I'm also very grateful that they have also separated out again for us information in relation to deaths that have occurred uh, in uh, the community in terms of in care homes and kept that separate uh, for us from those deaths that have, uh, that have occurred in the hospital setting as well. So it's a very complex um, situation. We don't normally report uh, on deaths on a daily basis in relation to any uh, condition. Uh, as the Minister has said, this has been a very rapidly evolving situation. I mean, it's 26th of February, we had our first case uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and it, that seems like a lifetime ago. I know for all of those who have been working in the front line, all of us who have been affected, and all of those who have sadly, tragically lost uh, loved ones. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's, it's you know as, as you acknowledge yourself, it did cause some alarm, it caused, and, and there is that potential for it. So it's uh, it, it's something that we would welcome that 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 that, that clarity. Um, another quick one in relation to the modelling, and you've mentioned the importance of the modelling to us now as we move forward. Is that modelling now taking taking place? Are we are we available to avail of the figures from the south and also to input our figures? Is that modelling taking place now? I think one of one of the things that that, that has been helpful, Chair, is the modelling that we're doing here um, with our with our own modelling team in Northern Ireland now that we're progressing through through the virus and through a timeline. But it has also been a, a beneficial that we've established the memorandum of understanding. So we've been able to have access to, to the modelling that the Republic of Ireland has commissioned in regards to our own, plus still being part of SAGE and the modelling that comes out of, on, a, on a UK-wide basis. So we are able to, to produce, I suppose, a fuller report. Um, the Chief Medical Officer had a, a long engagement with his counterpart in the Republic of Ireland yesterday yeah. in regards to modelling. Um, we're, doing a, we're doing an update piece to the executive um, tomorrow, the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor in regards to where we are. Um, and our projections um, uh, in regards to Northern Ireland. But I think one thing that we always need to, to caveat, Chair, and, and, and when we do produce um, our modelling figures, they are a model. They're not a prediction. They're not, this is what's going to happen. So we always need to be cog cognizant of the fact that they, they are modelling. They're not something we, sh we should be pinning up as either targets to be achieved or, or not achieved. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I suppose that brings me on neatly enough to my next point in relation to, and I agree, modelling is only ever going to be a prediction. What tells us what's actually happening is testing, and I think that that's that's the crucial element. Um, on the twenty fourth of January, you you made a statement to the assembly that your the PHA are working uh, to ensure the appropriate testing, clinical pathways, and lines are in place for dealing. So that that's from quite an early point. On the 29th of January, you also said it's not unreasonable to assume at some point we'll have a, a positive case. So the work was already underway to, to scale up the testing, I suppose, from that point. Um, you also, and I acknowledge that, that you did provide regular updates and statements, and I thank you for that. But in another written statement on the 28th of February, you confirmed that contact tracing was taking place at that stage, at the 28th of February. And then on, coming forward to the 2nd of March, you said that the department had contributed to the UK-wide coronavirus action plan. So on the 19th of March, you stated at the outbreak, HSC laboratory service was processing around 40 tests. They have increased their capacity by a factor of five and are now capable of processing more than 200. And I believe the aim at that point was to get to 1,100 tests. So before I, before I go back to that 1,100, um, I'm still confused. We, we had requested the testing strategy and we received a paper from yourself dated the 9th of April, or dated the 6th of April. We received it on the 9th, or we considered our meeting, which is a COVID-19 testing strategy. But the actual strategy that you signed off on, we haven't yet seen. Can we get that copy of the testing strategies employed up to that date? The, the one prior to yes, the one we right. received yeah. on, on the 6th? Yeah. So we can get uh, uh, an idea of what the testing strategy was before it changed 
Well, I suppose at that, that point, Chair, um, our, our testing strategy was to, to concentrate on the priority groups that we had, the first group being those who were in the hospital um, presenting with COVID or COVID-like symptoms to make sure they were being treated in the right place. The second then was to extend to our frontline healthcare workers, and the third group was um, those who were in cohorted living accommodation, should that be a care home or supported living accommodation. So that was the strategy. Those, those three priority groups were laid out from the, the very initiation, from the starting of, of our strategy. I'll check to see if we have a, a, a specific document entitled strategy, um, but that was our key aim groups and our key target groups. Um, you did, and in my opening statements there as well, you, you mentioned the 1100 um, target. As I said in my opening statement on, on Tuesday, we, we, we had that target of 1112 <coughs> tests completed. Now, that's not individuals tested. so. So we have achieved that, and within the next week or so, working with partners in AFPE, uh, we're actually bringing their labs online, which will enable us to increase our in-house capacity even further. Chief, you want to yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think I think we're very clear throughout all of this uh, in our approach to uh, testing um, and our commitment and our delivery against increased testing capacity. And I just want to put on record again my thanks to all of the laboratories right across Northern Ireland, because if you remember. Uh, we were one of the first 13 uh, laboratories in uh, in the, the UK to um, uh, begin testing back, as I recall, uh, in early uh, February. Um, and I want to pay tribute to the staff in the Regional Virus Laboratory uh, within the Belfast Trust. We have now extended the testing right across uh, trusts uh, in Northern Ireland uh, at the Minister's request. I established a consortium with uh, the University of Ulster, Queen's University, Citric, and the Western Trust, uh, with AFB, uh, and a range uh, of other uh, partner organisations to rapidly scale up our testing capacity. At the outset, we were able and had a capacity to test 40 individuals a day. Uh, that's now somewhere in the region of 1,700. Uh, we compare very favourably, I've said to the committee before, in terms of our numbers of people tested per 100,000. Just, just let, me the let, let me interrupt you there, Michael. I, when, <coughs> when, when Robin was given his figures, he said that there's been 16,000 tests carried out. And on a, on a very quick <coughs> calculation there, if you break that down, that equates over, I'm taking a period roughly of six weeks and five days a week, you're, you're looking at it around about 500 a day. So, what is the current capacity at the minute? The, the current capacity, as the Chief Medical Officer has just said, we've, we've increased to 1,700 yeah. capacity. And we've how many? Okay. We, so we there's capacity for 1,700. How many are being completed? We completed 1,112 on Tuesday, and that's why we've been able to share, as, as I announced yesterday, that's why we've increased um, those eligible to test. And, uh, to, um, and, and I can give you the, the data here as we announced it. We've included that now. We'll include frontline workers in the private sector with a focus on staff delivering key medical energy, utility, transport and food supplies. <coughs> Those listed um, NHA can actually appear at a test centre without an appointment uh, by producing their ID. That includes an NHS ID, a central government department ID. Rob, sorry, sorry Robin, just, I, don't, I don't want because I'm very conscious of other members. I'm very conscious of you have very short, short term. Sorry, 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 what we'll say, we, we've increased that to those then in the private sector as well, mm -hmm. to include supermarkets, telecom industry, Royal Mail, um, who have all been contacted directly um, by, by the national partners. And employees who think they are eligible and need to be tested, if they speak to the employer, they can then contact uh, an email address, which I'll we'll share with the committee, where their employee can seek uh, access to that testing. But what I will say, Chair, as we increase, we increase our capacity, and then we we fill the slot. If you understand, so I mean, so we, we're, our capacity as we stand today is now up to 1,700, and on Tuesday we've done 1,100, so we have capacity for six. So we then go and expand and expand our catchment to make sure that we can fill that that capacity. But there is an important point, Chair, and you did uh, interrupt before I'd finished around your question and the answer to your question, which okay. is. We will not test this virus into submission. This virus is not going away. What we need to use is use our testing capacity intelligently. And as this epidemic evolves, so too we have evolved and continue to evolve how we use our testing. As the Minister announced, uh, we are moving to put in place surveillance in our general practices because it's crucially important before we get to the next phase, any decisions that we make, the executive makes about relaxing social distancing measures, that we have 
early intelligence in the community as to how the virus is behaving and if there's a resurgence of the virus. Similarly, uh, next week we will be introducing that surveillance into our emergency departments in terms of people uh, presenting there. As the Minister has indicated, we've taken a range of steps to ro a rolling programme of surveillance uh, within the independent uh, care sector. So as we move forward, we will be using our testing differently from the very outset. As we move forward again into the next phase, the challenge will be uh, the uh, need to ensure that we have ramped up and are able to, uh, our testing capacity, but also our contact tracing capacity, because we will begin to see uh, potentially further surges and the emergence of outbreaks. So it's not a, ma a matter of just testing and testing numbers. It's actually about the intelligence use of those tests, where we target them, and how we use them to inform what we need to do and the action that we need to take. And that's crucially important. Absolutely agree with that, Michael. And 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 uh, we recognise that progress has been, and we welcome the fact that progress has been made. Um, the World Health Organization have said very clearly you cannot fight a, flare, a fire blindfold. So it is actually crucial that, that the testing is informing the next steps, mm. which are the contact tracing, the further yes. testing, the isolation, yes. and all of that. So that's the measure. So I suppose I suppose then people people I suppose are wondering why there is a access capacity that, that that you would be able to meet match the capacity to what's being done. So I think people are, are saying yeah, and, and given it's such an important issue, yeah. why can and we not maximise it? And I suppose, Chair, that is because we increase capacity. I'm not going to, we're, we're not going to deliver a testing programme and then people turn up without being able to, to be tested. So we increase our capacity, then we move to fill that capacity. So we increase our capacity, then we fill to move it, rather than going the other way around. Because if, if we tell people, if we'd have told those groups no turn up to be tested, and then at the end of the day we didn't have the capacity to test frontline health workers or those in hospital, that would have been a failure to them. So it's always about increasing capacity and then increasing the group who fills it. So that's how we get into that wider space. But I think picking up also on what the Chief Medical Officer um, said, Chair, in regards to, um, I think we have to be careful as well in the message in regard to testing. Testing does not supply either a vaccination or immunity. Mm. It's a measure of any point of time whether someone has it. So you, you could be tested at a quarter past 12 this afternoon, Chair, and come up clear. By half twelve, you could have COVID-19. So it's it's about a measure at a matter of time. So I, I just want to make sure that people don't assume that a test means you will be clear forever. You know, so it's just. And I think we do. We do. I, I know understand you that, do, but, but, Chair. But I think but, it's careful but, to get. But that I suppose you need you need a level a, a high level of community testing to advise when you <coughs> can start to relax. The, the process. And that includes the double testing, by the way. So you need to factor that in. That people need tested at another time. That's that's that goes. So, as a, okay, listen, I'm going, to, I'm going to move on to members now. I'm going to take a group of questions now on the testing, if you can just take a note of the questions, and if we can keep the answers as succinct as possible. I'll, I'll go to the members on the phone now, start with uh, Pam Cameron. Pam, are you there? I am, yes, thank you, and thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, for being here today. Um, in terms of uh, testing, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that um, Eddie Lynch, the Older Persons Commissioner, has, has put out a call for all staff and all residents to be tested. Um, that would be the first point of my question, your reaction to that, and have you capability to do that, or will you have it in the near future? And the other point to my um, question uh, is in regard to uh, a care home, uh, an example, I'm not going to name it, um, uh, a funeral director has, has basically been in touch with uh, serious concerns after um, having been contacted by a care home um, in order to uh, remove a, de a deceased member of that care home. They were advised that, that that person had been tested and had tested negative for COVID-19. They then took the body, um, treated the body, including, including um, embalming, uh, only to then uh, be told that actually that uh, deceased person was actually positive for COVID-19 and now they're very concerned about safety and are, are really asking should all nursing homes uh, and deaths arising from nursing homes be treated as high risk with the coroner's office, uh, coroner's office taking control of those um, death processes. Thank you, Pam. And um, just, just to say to members, if your question has been asked, that we, we hope to get a second round in and 
members can then ask an uh, additional question if you don't have a question in this section. So I'll go then to the next person to come in. The phone was Orlea. Orlea, do you have a question on this? Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is around um, the there has been issues raised from psychiatrists and some mental health staff working in the inpatient and community settings um, around access to testing and appropriate PPE. Um, and I suppose the wider issue there, because I know that the email um, has been set up around the PP in particular, where staff can directly contact the department to flag up those issues. Um, but there was also an announcement, it was over two weeks ago now, um, from the um, uh, from the, the, the British government around a mental health um, helpline number for NHS staff. And I've been trying to get more information on this over the past couple of weeks, and I can't get any. So I'm concerned that when staff are dealing with those issues and concerns in their place of work, particularly around the, the issue that I'm raising around the mental health and patient units, what support have they got outside of that? And is that mental health helpline um, up and running for our staff? And I, I have other issues to raise around the mental health, but if we come in later on, then yeah. if that's okay, Chair. Thank you, Orlea. Uh, Colin McGrath? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, Chair, the um, Chief Medical Officer um, is reported as saying that aspects of our population density in the Republic and Northern Ireland means that there's a different impact on the island compared to GB. Just g given that, could, could I ask, um, given that there are low transit uh, rates between GB and NI at the minute, are we planning uh, testing and tracing uh, on a cross-border basis? Uh, and just what are the practical measures that have been taken to actually deliver that? And what, what, what can we see on the ground to prove that that's happening? Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Pat Sheehan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it has been flagged up regularly now uh, that contact tracing is an important element in combating this virus. I wanted to know, Minister, uh, why you stopped the contact tracing in the middle of uh, March. Okay, thank you. Um, now, Alex. Yeah, Alex. Thank yeah. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I can only ask one on this, can't I? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Um, in terms of the the testing in nursing homes, are all nursing home residents being tested, or is it just those that are maybe showing symptoms? Because um, I think the nursing homes are hotspots to a degree. And I think it probably would be best for all tested. Yep, thank you, Alex. Paula? Um, thank you, um, Minister. You were talking about the data that was being collected for surveillance purposes, and I'm just wondering are you also carrying out a rolling clinical audit of all cases in terms of medical history? I'm conscious that as we move through this pandemic, um, you're going to have to put in place new um, systems and programmes in primary. Um, secondary and tertiary care, so I'm just wondering whether you're looking at the medical history of the patients. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, there's been an impression created in some quarters that Northern Ireland is, is sort of playing catch-up uh, uh, and indeed maybe failing uh, in relation to testing. And uh, various contributors uh, to this committee, indeed as recently as last week, uh, did indicate that in relation to England, Scotland, Wales and Republic of Ireland, that uh, Northern Ireland is actually doing the best uh, in relation to testing. Is that still the case? Thank you. And Jerry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, PPE. Um, it's very concerning, obviously, we're hearing reports about health workers um, uh, being concerned about the guidance um, from England and it hasn't been ruled out, um, is my understanding, that uh, they can't be... Uh, or they'll be assured that they won't use PPE twice. Um, I think that's very concerning. RCN and Unison have raised concerns about that. And the department's own guidance in, in our pack um, says that uh, PPE should be used for one episode uh, of care. So I'd be concerned that there's different messages coming out. Uh, I'd be concerned that um, we'll have report or instances of PPE being used again, and it shouldn't be. Um, and also, just to make the minister aware, I, I've been informed that uh, there's due to be a significant delivery of PPE uh, by a major employer here next week, uh, 40,000 items. I can give him the details if he wants, but in my view, 
that should be coming to our frontline staff and that to a non-essential business which is going to be open uh, next week. Thank you. Okay, could you uh, work your way through those, please? At 40, if you let us know, Jerry. I'd be... It's from 40. <laughs> so, I thought we might have been saying that. Um, look, in regards to the guidance um, uh, for the PP, there, there was concerns raised in regards to when PHE um, actually issued their guidance about the, the potential to, to reuse. Um, our guidance um, has not changed. And um, what I was very clear when I said um, in regards to that guidance, I want to make sure there is enough PPE for all our staff at the point in time we're able to do that at this moment in time. I was asked to give the commitment um, would I never bring in that potential change where we may go down that, that line of asking staff to, to reuse PPE. And I, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be clear as I was when I was asked the question. I couldn't give that reassurance because I cannot hand and heart sit here today and say in two, three, four weeks' time we may not be in that position. So that's why we're doing everything we can to make sure that our PPE stocks are, are supplemented, are fulfilled. No matter what the source should it be working with the Republic of Ireland, the UK, sourcing our own in China, working with large and small manufacturers here uh, in Northern Ireland just to make sure that warehouse is full so that we can maintain and um, maintain and support the guidance that we have here in place in Northern Ireland at this minute in time, and that's our direction and that's our, our work, but I cannot stand, sit here hand in heart, and I wouldn't do that. It is, it's not my way of working. It's never been my way of working, of making a promise that I know I, I cannot keep in two or three weeks' time. So I hope the member... It, it's not maybe what the member wants to hear, but I hope he takes it from me as being genuine. Mm -hmm. that that's that the position I want to be is that staff should never be in, placed in that position. Uh, and that's why we set up the, the email address as well, where members can contact um, directly, or employees can contact directly. And that's been used, it's actually been used across the sector, from frontline workers to domestic care to community care workers who are actually emailing uh, with a number of concerns. Uh, we're, we're able to address those, pick those up, and go back to uh, the, the employee and trust or the employer. Um, Chair, I, I suppose in regards to, to the round on, on, on testing, um, care homes is a major focus of, of what we're doing at this moment in time, not just in <coughs> testing, uh, but also in additional support, because we do, we do realise the most vulnerable, the most susceptible to COVID-19 and its worst ravages are those elderly people in our population, and we are, we are aware that you know, care homes, nursing homes, because of the, the, the structure, because of where they are, are a potential um, for, for outbreaks and, and the development of, of larger outbreaks. So that's why we're working with the care home providers, uh, private sector and dependent on our, on our own internal ones to make sure that the support mechanisms are there and that, and that includes testing. We have um, started a testing programme within care homes, which mm. I'll ask the Chief Medical Officer to, to update you on. Um, in regards, I, I think it was Pam, in regards to um, the funeral director, um, Pam, I'm happy to take those details offline because I think that's a case that we, we do need to follow up on um, internally. I know you, you don't want to give the, the detail out here now, but that's something I think we will uh, follow up on. Um, Orla asked in regards to you know, the, the psychological support and will our frontline, you know, will our staff at any level have access to that GB number? We, we set up our own uh, internal structures. Uh, which was launched um, last week, because we do realise the mental trauma and angst and pressure that are on our staff throughout the system who are working to tackle COVID-19 and, uh, and non-COVID-19 patients because of, of the stress and strain that's there. So it's important that we provide that, that psychological and, and, and psychological support uh, for our staff at this minute in time. Um, so I think, Chair, that covers the majority. I think the Chief it, Medical Officer could pick up some just of the in relation of the to staff testing that, that yeah. Pam asked about. Oh, sorry, staff. staff as I said, you know, the, the staff testing our frontline, our frontline staff, and anybody within the employed within the NHS are, are eligible for testing. If all they have to do is turn up, uh, and even on the ID sites, if they turn up with an NHS ID, 
they will be prioritised, or when they're prioritised, they will be tested. So that access for staff testing has always been there and will remain so because yeah. of one of our, our key priorities. Staff. Happy to pick up on some of the others okay. there. Um, certainly in terms of PAMS and uh, Alex, your question, which I think was really around care homes, we're absolutely aware of the concerns uh, around care homes, the vulnerability of those individuals. And as you've said, Alex, that uh, we have uh, seen outbreaks within the sector uh, and that's uh, concerning. Uh, this is a new virus and we need to understand how it behaves uh, within that sector. Uh, from the outset, when we had introduced our testing priorities way back uh, early early March, uh, healthcare workers in that environment could have a test. There always has been a programme of testing uh, individuals where there is an outbreak, those people are resident in nursing and residential uh, sector. We have now extended that to include everyone uh, within uh, the care home where those uh, outbreaks have occurred, including staff, and our, our rolling programme of uh, expansion of that testing. In relation to the coroner, there are clear, uh, under Section 7 of, of the Coroner's Act, there are clear conditions in which uh, um, cases are referred uh, to the coroner if indeed there's cause for concern or the death requires uh, further investigation. Not all deaths from COVID-19 uh, require to be reported to, to the coroner. In relation to Colm and Pat's questions uh, around um, contact tracing and um, testing and, uh, and, and contacting uh, on a, 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 given the interface between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, uh, as we, uh, in the containment phase, Pat, our focus was very much uh, focused on testing uh, and contact tracing. Now, when you move into a phase of where there's widespread community transmission, the benefit uh, at that time of continuing active contact tracing and testing is diminished because essentially anyone in the community could be uh, a source of or could, of, of infection. And if you recall, at that the WHO or Michael? sorry, Pat, if I could answer the question, uh, yeah. as as, um, as we moved into the next phase, as you will recall, the decision uh, was made. Uh, um, uh, supported by the executive to put in place a range of measures uh, around social distancing that involved uh, two sp very specific elements. It involved us communicating clearly to the public what the symptoms were, recognising even at that early stage that uh, given the levels of transmission in Northern Ireland that, that there would be other reasons why people would have a, a continuous a new cough or a fever, but advising those individuals uh, to stay at home and then also their household contacts to stay at home because we know uh, that those are the individuals most likely uh, to be. Michael, I, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, I understand all that. What I don't understand is why contact tracing was stopped here around the 12th of March, given that the advice, the advice from the WHO and from very uh, eminent uh, professionals in the field of epidemiology, infectious disease, public health, and so on. People like Gabriel Scali, uh, Sam McConkey, who's from this parish also, have all been calling out for testing uh, on a community basis, as well as contact tracing. Uh, why did we stop it here? I, I think I've answered your question, uh, um, uh, Pat, if, if I'm really honest, and we are guided by expert scientists currently actively working on the field in the field based on expert scientific analysis and based who, who on are those sorry Pat, 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 sorry. Just, just hold on a minute there uh, you need to come through the chair yeah you need to, you need to come through the chair Pat. what, oh, what? Uh, chair, chair with respect i mean i don't think i'm getting an answer to the question well we're, we're going to we're going to move move well first of all i'm going to seek some clarity in relation to Matt Hancock said yesterday that we need to test, trace, and isolate. Exactly. Yeah. So was was that was that decision to stop contact tracing for for a period of time a mistake? Now looking back. No, it was it was based on sound uh, public health uh, considerations. And what I was trying to get on to say, Pat, and this is the important point that Colin also raised, is as we move into the next phase of our response uh, to the uh, to the pandemic. What we are likely to see once we get through this initial wave uh, is that we will see outbreaks, further outbreaks in a uh, care home sector, perhaps in, in a hospital setting. What we will see is local pockets of community outbreaks, and that's why the surveillance that I mentioned earlier is crucially important. And what we then need to do is to ramp up our capacity to contact, trace and test 
so that we can ensure that we very quickly get on top of those local pockets. So this isn't a question of saying that testing isn't important, or this isn't a question of saying contact tracing is an important part. What this is important, this is an important point of saying the timing of the introduction of those. So the time whenever we moved into the delay phase with uh, communication to the public about self-isolation, household isolation, uh, we moved into a different phase where we need to target our testing capacity and resource into managing uh, that wave of the pandemic. As we come out the other side of that, the contact tracing and testing was going to be crucially important. Column's point uh, in relation to uh, how we do that, absolutely, it's crucially important uh, that we work collectively uh, with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland and indeed the conversation that I had uh, yesterday with. Uh, 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 Tony Hulohan's team was in relation uh, to that. So that's the close cl uh, cooperation that the Minister previously referred to between our respective public health bodies, our scientists uh, uh, in, uh, in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, the Chief Scientific Advisor here in Northern Ireland, uh, and actually using common uh, platforms where that's possible, using technology, uh, you know, digital uh, apps, etc., to support the contact tracing effort, because this is going to be like contact tracing that we have never uh, seen or experienced before, and we need to rapidly ramp up the capacity of our own public health agency. Colleagues in the HSE are similarly doing that, and again, uh, colleagues right across the UK. So this isn't saying uh, that testing and contact tracing isn't important. This is actually saying that it is becoming increasingly important, and it will be more important in the next phase of our response. Michael, you said there that uh, you'd received scientific advice around the decision to stop contact tracing. Can the committee get that advice from you? I think the, the, sci the scientific advice uh, which was provided to us by uh, SAGE is and will be available in due course. So, um, Well, why well, in due course? Why is it, it this, is a, this is a number of weeks ago, I take it? When it's available, Chair, we'll make it available to, to the committee. Uh, back, sorry, I think we, we didn't pick up on Paula's question, which was in regards to, to the clinical audit. And I think that is important because, uh, if members recall, when we were seeing our, our first deaths due to COVID-19 uh, in Northern Ireland and actually across the world, they were always being recorded with an underlying health condition. So it's important that we do do that, that piece of work, both of people who are hospitalised at this minute in time, but also people who are presenting through our COVID-19 centres, because it is important for us to realise if there's a an underlying health condition that makes COVID-19 more prevalent and yeah. spread or actually more ravenous in its infection when it actually, it, it actually does infect an individual. It's important so that we're able to manage so we can prepare the health service for the, for the, next, for the next phase when it comes. So is that a commitment that you're going to start doing we, that? We are already. Yes, we have, yes, we have been doing that. Yes. Yes, we are already doing but, but I, I, again, it. But again, it's one of those things, when we get through this first wave, we'll be able to concentrate yeah. on how we manage and prepare the health service for the next wave. And it actually comes to that point then, if we see an underlying condition uh, that is more prevalent or more susceptible to, to the worst ravages, we can start to target those people, as we did for, you know, for the social isolation and the shielding letters that went out from GPs, there were specific medical conditions that were, I suppose, judged to be more susceptible or more more of a concern, so they were asked to shield for the 12 to 14 work weeks initially. So it's a matter of working through then when we can look back historically um, over who has presented, where they, you know, did, were they hospitalised, did they go to the ICU, so we're able to use that, that data to make sure when it comes to the, to the next stage, to the next phase or the next surge that we're prepared, we can support the people who need the, need the most, because one of the things about our National Health Service there, there's no difference, there's no buyer, there's no judgment in regards to who can access it and when they access it. So it's important that we get the steps in place to protect and support everybody equally. Okay. I mean, just we're sharing that information because um, it is an important point. I mean, this again is a new virus. I mean, uh, SARS CoV 2 emerged first on the 8th of December of last year. It's, it's, it's just rem remarkable when you think that it's that's such a short time ago. Uh, and COVID-19, we are learning more about it. That sharing of intelligence about how the virus is behaving, but also how it's affecting people, uh, is crucially important. Some of the initial reports uh, coming out of China suggested those who, who smoked uh, cigarettes were at greater risk of uh, complications. 
Um, we know that some factors such as obesity, again, seem to, to be factors. We know, as the Minister has said, that uh, those with underlying health conditions. Uh, so internationally, clinicians are cooperating and sharing that intelligence and information, but not just that, but in terms of most effective treatment. So our intensive care, our ICMAR, our intensive care societies across these islands and internationally are sharing information about how best to provide respiratory support uh, to, uh, to individuals, um, and we're rapidly learning uh, in that space. The other important aspect of this is that, uh, unfortunately, a vaccine is some time off um, and will be uh, challenging. And in the interim, uh, it is crucially important that we very uh, uh, quickly and as soon as possible develop effective either prophylactic uh, treatments or drugs that could perhaps delay or prevent individuals uh, acquiring uh, at least severe disease and also uh, to treat COVID-19. And again, there's very active clinical trials going on uh, right across these islands, uh, right across Europe and globally. Uh, and Northern Ireland, our, our patients are, and researchers are fully uh, participating in that. So I think that in the gap between what we're seeing now uh, and hopefully at some future date when we do have an effective vaccine, uh, the area of clinical trials, randomised uh, clinical trials, people being able to benefit themselves from being enrolled in those trials, but also in terms of developing our knowledge of what works. Uh, so I think it's crucially important we continue to uh, develop effective. In, ter in terms of, and finally, no, sorry, Paul, I need to move on. In terms of, a, finally, on, on the testing issue, what percentage of that testing will be dedicated towards community surveillance uh, in GPs? And will there be a few areas who get full community testing? And how will those areas be chosen? Um, uh, the primary care testing will commence uh, commences this week. Initially, that will be within. Uh, we have well. So let me wind that back. What we have is a well-established system in place of spotter practices for flu sentinel surveillance. So you'll recall the report that you will receive and is published each. Uh, uh, year during flu season about the levels of flu activity. So we will be using those thir 36 uh, GP spotter practices, uh, which represent about you know 10% or so, 11% of GP practices. So they're, they are uh, across uh, Northern Ireland. We'll be starting that initially in the 13 uh, GP uh, uh, spotter practices uh, within, the, uh, within the Greater Belfast area. So that's in the Belfast Trust area and Southeastern Trust area. Only because that's where we're seeing at present uh, the greatest uh, rate of uh, community transmission uh, of COVID-19, but then into the following week that will be extended out uh, to all of the other 36 uh, practices right across uh, Northern Ireland. I can certainly uh, provide uh, details of those. We're also working very closely uh, with our colleagues in primary care, GP colleagues, colleagues in the RCGP and, and BMA, who uh, and the Health and Social Care Board. Uh, because, again, we would be keen, uh, if it's practically possible, to also look to our COVID-19 centres, uh, where individuals are you know, presenting, as you know at the minute, individuals who phone their general practitioner with symptoms or uh, are rag-rated in terms of whether they're uh, you know, green, in terms of they're able to self-isolate and, and manage themselves at home and contact the GP, etc., if they have problems, or those who are amber-rated who need to be assessed in the COVID-19 centre. So, again, we want to... Uh, whilst recognising those COVID-19 centres weren't established for testing, they were actually there for providing assessment clinical care. We wish to consider uh, and work with colleagues to see if we can introduce that testing there. Similarly, into, uh, into the care home sector, I can't give you the exact percentages uh, at this time because those numbers haven't yet uh, been completely worked through. Um, and then also into our emergency departments. We'll be starting with one emergency uh, department again in the Greater Belfast area, with a view to moving out into the west, northwest, and indeed ultimately across all uh, emergency departments in Northern Ireland. Because again, it's that the, the intelligent use of the testing capacity is crucially important as we move into, into this next phase, so we can get that public health data about how the virus is behaving and if we're beginning to see the virus uh, re-emerge. Uh, which might be an in early indicator of uh, further uh, problems and perhaps a second wave. Okay, um, I want to get another quick round of questions because members have, and, and, and obviously it's it's uh, you're looking at your watch, Robin. I think that's actually I think that's actually a, an issue we need to address. It it has been it has been regretted when we have tried to create the maximum space, but members here do have a duty to. Yeah, no, to no, 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 I think what we need I think what we need to what, what we're going to need to do is ask you to come back next week because these questions are rolling on. Um, so I think we're going to need and to. And Chair, I, I think it would be helpful then, maybe when we do get to that stage, that we get different questions, mm -hmm. rather than the same questions um, repeated. 
Well, I think in fairness, it's, it's up to the members of the committee to decide what the questions are, Robin. And, and I don't think there has been a huge repetition of questions. What there has been is a lack of clarity around what the actual steps are. It's been acknowledged that the capacity for testing has 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 not been fully utilised. There's wide concern in the community that and, and, and the, and the, World, the World Health Organisation have said to 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 defeat this, you need to detect all cases, test test cases, contact trace, and treat all cases. And there is concern with the committee. So I think I think with due respect, it's up to the committee to decide the questions. Um, so listen, I do want to get a quick round of questions. In particular, there's, there's, a, there's a, an, an ongoing concern about the spread within care homes and the vulnerability of care home residents. I know we've touched on the testing. I'm not, I'm not asking to go back over that issue on testing. I welcome the fact that you've, you've uh, announced additional support for care homes, but I'm wondering what that support will look like and whether that is, it will be mandatory in terms of repurposing people into care homes. And I think it's welcome that the hospital's situation as a result of some of the measures that have been taken are is better than it maybe could have been, and that provides an opportunity now to maybe do better by the care home. So could you give us some information on that? Well, the, the, um, in regards to repurposing staff, it will I'll not be mandatory. There is a voluntary commitment, and that's why we're engaged with the unions in regards to that support as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's asked in there because we'll not mandate staff to go into that, you know, the, the independent private sector. But we are seeing a good uptake um, from, from our, our own staff members, but also from the volunteers. Who stepped through or stepped up to our, our voluntary, you know, our, our call for volunteers, so that we do have that support mechanism there for for the independent and private care homes and our own care homes as well, to make sure that we can provide a security and a reassurance um, for those people who are in what is the, basically their home chair, you know, and that's one thing we need to be, be cognizant of as well, because there has been, I suppose, there has been studies in the past of the stresses of strain when you take somebody that's been in a care home and move them to a different facility, it does have an adverse impact. So that's why we're trying to put in the mechanisms that allow um, the residents to stay within their own um, their own facility than something that's, that, that's known to them as well. So we're also looking, there is a number of, um, I suppose there's a number of, of care home providers that have indicated to us uh, ad, ad advanced uh, or additional financial pressure um, in regards to sourcing their own PPE, but also paying for those staff members um, who are off duty self isolation or because they've tested positive, you know, not provision for SSP and having to bring additional. So we're working at a, a through a measure of those, uh, how we support that. Okay. Um, time for a few really quick questions. I have Jerry first, then Paula, and then I'm going to check the phone, but I want these really short. And yeah, really thanks, Jerry. I, I concur with your, your, I know you've done your best, but I think time has been rushed. I understand the Minister is obviously busy with. You know, respond to this, but I think we get us more time for for maximum scrutiny. I think is essential. Just on deaths, I mean, obviously, um, very sensitive and all that. Um, but I mean, the Financial Times, a reputable newspaper, has indicated that the figures, uh, the death figures, could be closer to 500. I think a chief medical officer said that um, it may be a few years before we know the full death toll figures. Um, we've got an indication from Mike Tomlinson in Queen's University saying that the deaths per million uh, are higher in the north and in the south. So I'd be concerned if we're talking about, obviously, death in any circumstance uh, of hundreds of people is worrying, but we may not have an accurate figure of the total death figures, and that's concerning in and of itself, but also if we're talking about exit in the lockdown. Uh, Very complicated question, please, that. I want to get all my So mind. my question is, um, are we in a situation where we are unsure or we have uh, an inaccurate uh, a number of, of, of deaths at this time. Um, Jerry, I think in answer to that, you know, the, the official reporting body, as the, as the chief medical officer said earlier, on, you know, was NISRA, and that's why you know the, the report that they do, there is a there's a week of time lag uh, where they actually they study and analyse uh, death certificates that are, are presented to them. So you know, they are the professional body that, that we look to for that. But what's concerning, I, I suppose, is the disparity on the year-on-year -year comparison. And that's the piece of work as well. That why we encourage people to come, still come forward to emergency departments and GPs because our concern is that people not presenting with strokes or suspected heart attacks are actually added, adding to that that increased figure. But in regards to again the the comparators that are that are currently out there, um, some of them I think are misinformed and ill-judged. Um, Minister, not all frontline key workers have access to a car. Are there any testing facilities that are not drive-through facilities? 
Um, there, there still are some testing facilities that are, are in hospital based and as we move to GP basin as well there will be access to them but I'm also aware the likes of the Belfast Trust has actually worked with one of the, the taxi providers and provided a shielded car so they've actually taken cars and put in purse backs between the passenger in the back and the driver so that if anybody needs transport uh, to one of those testing facilities they can get it but if somebody needs tested we'll make sure they get tested and they don't have to drive there Paula. So uh, it's important for us to oh, be able to... Uh, uh, the public health agency said that they weren't responsible for that and it wasn't no. in Belfast it was outside but... Right, well, the, 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 look, the public health agency wouldn't be probably responsible for getting somebody to a test, okay. but look, we'll, we'll make sure there's support mechanisms there, and if you have cases... I've already emailed you. Okay. Right. Alex, <laughs> okay. Alex uh, and then just, uh, if the Minister... Al could, sorry, uh, I only had Alex first, and then yourself. Sorry, yeah, Alex, pardon. please. Right. Okay, um, thank you, Minister. Um, I'm worried about um, the potential for a second wave. Um, what plans are we putting in, in, in place for that? Because, obviously... As we move on, things get better. We start to lift restrictions. So, what are you planning for that? Just one, Alex. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go <laughs> ahead. I'm, I want to have to be fair. Go ahead. Please. Yeah, I think I'd, I mean, the important elements are that our health and social care system is ready for any surge, and that will be right across from you know, beds and hospitals, intensive care, importantly, capacity in the community uh, sector, nursing homes, care homes that they have. Uh, resilient surge plans, and we're working very diligently right across the sector to ensure that's the place. Because uh, you're absolutely right, now is the time to do that. The second element of that will be in put in place the aspects that I referred to earlier in terms of the enhanced capacity around testing and contact tracing, and in ensuring that we're able to exchange that uh, information rapidly across this island, recognising that there is absolutely a flow of people. Uh, people often live. Uh, in the same time, uh, well, half of the time, uh, another part of the time uh, in the Republic of Ireland. So we are working very diligently to enhance our capacity in that respect. It's crucially important uh, that we have both of those elements covered. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Alan? Uh, yes. Uh, Minister, just in, in uh, relation, we, we're aware that ailments in nursing homes and care homes can spread very, very quickly. Um, if a, a resident of a care home or nursing home is showing uh, symptoms of, of the virus, uh, are they immediately removed to a hospital setting or are they treated and isolated within the, the nursing home or the care home? The, basically whatever is appropriate for the individual and it will depend. Um, uh, so in other words, um, in terms of there's two aspects to it. There's firstly the clinical care of the individual. The person will get the most appropriate clinical care and discussion with the individual where that's possible with the involvement of their family. Uh, and indeed with the uh, general practitioner and the hospital as, a, as appropriate. The other element to then is the management of that outbreak, uh, because obviously it's very important that that individual is appropriately nursed and managed with appropriately PPE to protect the staff member, but also to protect other residents. And in, that also might include cohorting of individual patients. If there is an outbreak in a care home, the public health agency will, in those situations, works very closely, does a rapid risk assessment, uh, working closely uh, with, with the care home, provides all the advice required around PPE, uh, the isolation cohorting of patients and appropriate cleaning, etc. And we also have the RQIA, which has been repurposed uh, to provide support uh, to the sector, and that's been uh, very uh, successful as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pam, I know that you had indicated a question earlier. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and I want to ask, in terms of communications, Minister, um, I've been contacted by members of the deaf community, and obviously um, many of them are obviously deaf, but they also don't read because um, reading the English language is not their, um, their first language. It's signing. And they are very concerned that there's nothing in place in terms of um, signing and therefore communication in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. So there's very great concerns about how um, the critical messages are communicated, in, and especially for those who are maybe potentially affected by COVID-19 and, and how they can communicate and can communicate from uh, different scenarios, including from um, hospitals. Thank you, Pam. Uh, I know, Vice Chair, this is something that, that you've, you've, you've worked hard on and, and you have raised um, uh, before. Um, we have been working with uh, the Department of Communities and the Health and Social Care Board, and we do hope to have something in place actually, actually tomorrow, which will include um, two elements, a video relay service and a video remote interpreting service. 
Um, the detail of that is, is being finalised and will be announced tomorrow because the, with ourselves, Department of, for Communities and the Health and Social Care Board. So it's something we've been conscious of. You've raised with, with us. Uh, you've raised with us in the past, so hopefully tomorrow we should have steps towards a temporary solution to that. It won't be a permanent one, but to try and alleviate those concerns and to make sure there's a support that's there uh, for everyone in the community. And that will be in British and Irish sign uh, as well. So does it take account of the particular sort of it cultural does. and, and sign language issues within yes, it the... Well, we'll, we'll do both, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Or Leah, I know that you had also indicated a question uh, earlier. Yes, thank you, Chair, and um, thanks to the Minister and Dr McRae. Uh, look, there, there's been plenty of talk even today, rightfully so, around planning for a future second wave, which is obviously really worrying, and the Department needs to do all the planning that it can to deal with that. But I am also really concerned, and I would like to ask the Department, are we doing any planning or modelling? Is the Department doing any planning or modelling on... Um, on, on dealing with the, the mental health aftermath of, of this pandemic, um, because this is going to be a wave that is going to come at us also. Um, so I just want to know, is the department monitoring any of this? Is there assessments ongoing around people currently in services mentally ill who are getting worse about people on top of that who are coming through services? Because I think we are going to have a, a wave, a pandemic. We already had one before um, the, the, the virus broke out. So is there any plans that are happening? I know there's some plans taking place in NHS England and Scotland. Um, just what is our department doing here? Thank you. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, we, we realise the, the stresses and strains that's there due to the regulations, but also due to the, the, the fear factor that has COVID-19. So it's something we, we have been working on to make sure that, that our mental health strategy and action plan is still kept, kept alive and is actually more, more relevant um, as we work our way through this, one of the things I've actually asked, um, asked the Department and the Permanent Secretary to bring forward is one of, the, one of the recommendations that I had in that was the appointment of a mental health champion. So we're moving now to put that in place um, within, the next, uh, within the, in the next period of time so they can begin that independent work um, of seeing where our mental health action plan and, and the strategy lies and how it will need to be refreshed and revisited in regards to, I suppose, the aftermath um, of, of COVID-19 and the additional strains and stresses that it has placed on people. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Michael. I, I'm just going to say, I mean, I, I think that as Chief Medical Officer, well, it, it's a, an issue that uh, concerns me uh, greatly. Um, I think that um, there are various levels of this, um, the psychological impact that there's been in every one of us. Uh, who have been traumatised as uh, as a result of this? I think, and, and it's no, and I mean everyone in terms of in the population because of the social distancing and the impact that has had in all of our lives. You're you're absolutely correct that it is acutely, uh, acutely felt, uh, particularly uh, in those in uh, disadvantaged uh, communities, uh, those uh, others who uh, perhaps do not have the access and network supports, the elderly, uh, those who are shielding, uh, the impacts of of isolation from family and friends. Uh, and then particularly those with underlying um, health, mental health problems, uh, this is, is having a very significant impact on the, the population's uh, mental health and well-being. The Public Health Agency, as you are, are aware, has been working very hard, at, again, as colleagues in, in England and Scotland that you refer to, to get messages out and support and provide online support uh, to individuals and also including, uh, but most importantly, we will have to ensure that as we move into any next phase, that as well as managing any and planning for any future wave of impact of the virus, we need to ensure that we're able to deal with the wave of impact of uh, on mental health, psychological ill health, the trauma associated with this, and also the impact on other important services. Um, you know, the number of people who were waiting for treatment uh, prior to this was already too high. Um, and it is even uh, greater. So we are very actively planning as to uh, how we can address the totality of that as we move out of this wave. I think we are still not out of this wave, but just to reassure you that whilst, as in, in response to Alex's question, why we're planning for next waves, we're also planning for that important part in the middle in terms of how we get back to ensuring that as Minister said, that people have confidence in accessing our services, and when they need uh, access to those services, that they can access them in a timely way, and we get through some of the backlog 
uh, of, of problems that we have created as a result of our efforts to save lives during this first wave of the pandemic. Okay, and just Pat and Colin then, do you have a quick, a quick question there, Pat? Yeah, um, who's taken the lead in the department on contact tracing and have they begun a recruitment process yet to, for uh, contact tracers? And if so, how many have been recruited so far? I'm happy to provide those numbers for you. Uh, the, I'm, working, I'm taking a lead in that, working very closely with colleagues in the PHA. We're piloting, uh, the, uh, we're actively working with a range of bodies to in increase the recruitment uh, of uh, contact tracers, working very closely with uh, our local uh, Department for Communities, local government environmental health officers, uh, medical students, nursing students, uh, to put in place a programme of training. We're going to pilot uh, that enhanced contact tracing uh, early next week. Um, then we have a four-week uh, plan, programme plan to provide the training uh, for those individuals so that we are ready uh, to uh, turn that uh, service on when that's required. Thank I'll you. provide further details. Pat, Pat, I'm going, Pat, Pat I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to move on to Colin there. Um, I, was, I, was just, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear how many he said have been recruited so far. Uh, well, we have offers of, four, of 400. Um, uh, again, and we estimate that we will probably need somewhere between 300 and 600 uh, in the in the next phase of our response. Uh, so we have a graduated plan uh, to increase those numbers to start the training. And as I said, and maybe it did break up, we will be piloting the first element of that uh, the uh, next beginning next week. I think it's the 27th of April. When you say offers of 400 megawatts, what does that mean? Uh, well, that, that means individuals, for instance, across uh, from environmental health officers who you know, currently working in local, uh, local government, a very skilled uh, a cadre of individuals. We have uh, nursing students, 800 uh, nursing students who uh, we can retrain and repurpose. Similarly, we will have medical students. Uh, so there's a, you know, if we look at the, uh, you know, the volunteering scheme that we have, we have already from that have had something like 16,500 applications which is converted into 11,000 people uh, who have actually completed applications and, uh, and over 4,000 or so who are, are, are now work ready. So uh, the, the numbers of individuals, uh, Pat, just to reassure you, uh, I'm confident we will have uh, the numbers uh, to actually carry out the contact tracing. What will be crucially important is the timeliness uh, of the uh, training program and also uh, using uh, you know digital technology, uh, I, mean, I probably don't have time to go into all of the detail, but we are plugged in to colleagues in the Republic of Ireland using the digital platform that they are using uh, to enhance contact tracing. Because obviously the two systems will have to talk to each other, uh, as uh, as I said in, in response to Colum's uh, question, because we're going to have to share uh, information very actively, uh, and also we are working uh, with colleagues both in NHS uh, X, which is uh, in England around the digital app, telephone app, <coughs> and similarly colleagues in uh, Republic of Ireland in relation to their digital app, which again uh, will allow, as I've, as I've explained before, uh, individuals who test positive using a unique identifier uh, on a voluntary uh, basis uh, to confirm, and then uh, their mobile phones will contact uh, those who have been, they've been in close proximity. We can program uh, the uh, phones to ensure that that, back to the first phase of the response, that that's people who individuals have been in contact uh, you know, less than two metres for more than 15 minutes. Okay. So again, just to say th that that is a very active piece of work at this time, and I'm happy to provide further details on that. Well, back, but I'm still not clear, Megan, when you say offers, how many have actually been I presume there's a recruitment where you sign a contract with people? There is. Recruit, you know, how yeah. many people have been I don't, have I don't have those numbers with me, but happy to provide that. Okay. Colin, Alan, I'll, I'll, I'll see yeah. if I can get time. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, there's been much reference today to the issue of modelling, and I just wanted to ask you maybe a quick question. Is that model just simply handed to us by London, or is it something that we can have a full uh, input to? And then is that model, are we permitted to actually take that model and then look at it on an all-island basis? Because, you know, the virus doesn't know any borders, uh, and we are uh, on an island. So is the modelling that we're doing uh, taking into consideration that the approaches need to be harmonised both north and south. Colin, our, our modelling is our modelling is Northern Ireland model, and we're not handed it by anybody. Uh, I've established our own group that does that. Uh, worked with both the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. So our modelling is, uh, is our modelling. And as I said earlier on, you know that's still we have the conversations with both north, south, and east, west. 
in regards to, to how they best plug in to, to each other, I think was your phrase. So we have those conversations regularly, as I said, you know, the Chief Medical Officer had a conversation with his, his counterpart in the Republic of Ireland earlier on. Okay. Um, just a, a final one from me uh, on in the, on the childcare. Uh, there was when there was additional funding announced. There was a childcare scheme rolled out. Can you give us a quick update on the take up of that scheme and how effective it's been to, to give key workers childcare to let them get out to work? I don't have have the numbers, Chair, but it's something we did in, in conjunction with the Department of Education, and that was actually putting the childcare or, or someone into a key worker's yes. home. Now, I, I don't have the figures to date because you know, the education was, was doing a lot of work in conjunction with with us in that because they were they were they were, they were, they were facilitating that where, where they could. So I don't have those numbers. I can get them again. But I, again, it is something that is provided crucial in regards to making sure we get support to get some of our key workers back online because the majority of our staff are female. So it's about as much support that we can actually give to make sure we get the support that they needed to get back in. I'll take one from him. Don't worry, Earl. Uh, listen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think you're being given away indulgence there. A very, very quick topical question, topical question Mr Chairman, uh, around cemeteries. Uh, could the minister uh, tell me, is there any medical or scientific reason for cemeteries to remain closed? Um, look, um, maybe shouldn't have took it. <laughs> look, again, it is, it is a topical <clears throat> Question on, and it's something you know. I, I, I made clear yesterday my personal uh, preference. I, I don't see any reason um, why cemeteries should be closed at this moment in time. They could be managed on an appropriate basis with appropriate measures and supports um, put in place. Um, because again, come back. I think it was all this point as, as well in regard to the mental support that we need to give individuals. There are a number of people in our community who get that reassurance, that mental. Uh, support and strength by going to a graveyard and visiting a grave. So again, it's about the balances that we put in to make sure support, su uh, support mechanisms and restrictions and regulations that we put in don't have uh, an adverse effect. Um, the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor are providing um, uh, an input into a number of questions to the Executive tomorrow, uh, and at that point the Executive uh, will make the decision because of all the regulations that are in place. Uh, are in the name of health. I brought them forward on behalf of the executive, so it's, uh, uh, the decision will lie with the executive to, to, to either ease those or strengthen those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation here today and, and for your answers to, to the questions. I suppose from the outset, this committee has said that we would engage with you constructively, and we will seek and we will continue to do that. But I think the key word within that is engage, so we, we, we will need to engage yeah, with you. And, 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 and I think, Chair, sorry, sorry for my, my, my outburst earlier on in regards to questioning, but every now and again, we do seem, I, I think, get into where, where we get the same questions. There's a lot more stuff I would love to be telling you about yeah. where we are, what we're doing. Um, so, look, we're willing to come back. I'm, I'm not sure where, if we can do it next ne next Thursday, but I, I have no problem engaging. Look, I update the executive on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday as to where we are. The committee and the role you have played is equally as, invite, equally as important to us because the work and the support that you are given there to the messages that we as a department want to drive home, but also the messages that we need the public to hear. Your support and, and your encouragement through what has been a very difficult time, and your understanding as well, uh, is welcome. Because uh, you know, as, as a committee, your role in, in scrutinising us and supporting us and what we're doing is vital at this moment in time. And chair, that's why I provide you and the vice chair with as many regular updates uh, as I possibly can when, when things are, when there's things that I think you need to know, and vice versa. You know, I think we have a, we have a good communication that way. And also with the vice chair, so we, we have no problem with keeping you up to date. I, I think, to be to be frank, I know we preach social distancing, but I think this is a better model than trying to to phone in because yeah. when I did it the last time, it was it was difficult to to interact with members. So I appreciate the the steps you've taken to do that today. But chair, just once again, I want to thank the members for their continued support and enhancing and pushing out the message that we need to get across while we while we work through this phase and. At some point, get back to the more, what would you say, the, the more routine things that we were doing more just over ten weeks ago. Yeah, well, like a long I think day. I think we do. I think we do. Yeah, we absolutely need to deal with the fundamentals. We need to anticipate and prepare for further waves. We need to therefore. 
apply the lessons that we have learnt from, from across the world, but also from what's happened here, and, and to ensure that we don't, um, we don't repeat any, any issues that we can pick up on the lessons and implement them. So listen, thank you very much, and I wish you both all the best. Um, we look for now. Members, I would propose now that we take a short comfort break to get our next contribution in on the phone. Thank you. We'll take a break and come back at 11.56, uh, 11.10, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the uh, meeting is now reopened. And can I advise the members that the departmental officials are here today via teleconference to brief the committee on the departmental budget? I refer members to the papers at tab 7 of the pack, to the raised paper at tab 1, and to tab 7 of the table papers. So, first of all, I would like to welcome Ms. Neelia Lloyd, Director of Finance. Are you there, Neelia? I am, please, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bridget Worth, Investment Director. Bridget, do we have you online? Yes, I'm here too. And Ms. Kira Dolan, Director of Transformation. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so just before we start, I, uh, I think I, I, we need to flag up that the papers and the information has come very late to the committee. There's obviously a considerable amount of information to be analysed and questions arising from that. In light of that, what, I'm, what, we, what we have agreed is that we will ask you to do your presentation today. We will take some questions on your briefing, but we will require you to come back next week to, to give the members an opportunity to have read the extensive information that has been provided and to come back with questions. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just alert you to that and I'll maybe ask you then to go ahead and do your briefing in, that, in light of that. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you're content, I will provide the opening remarks in relation to the resource budget, while Bridget will provide the opening remarks on the capital budget. Yes. So you will have received our templates on 1920 and 2021 resource budget position, and I really would just like to really draw out some of the key points from, from those templates in, in these opening remarks for you. In terms of 1920, the department received an opening resource budget settlement of 5.6 billion, or an increase of 3.8% against the comparable funding levels in the previous year. As in previous years, the department has been reliant upon a significant level of in-year funding in 1920, most notably for staff-related costs. Through the post-budget exercise and the June monitoring round, we received an additional 153.5 million, with 116.2 million of this from the Confidence and Supply Health Transformation Funding. This additional funding was reflected in the Department's main estimate, together with 69.7 million of funding for pension increases. Whilst this funding was not received until later in the year, the Department of Finance had requested that we reflect this anticipated allocation in the main estimate. The main estimates were approved in Westminster on October 19. The Department of Finance subsequently commissioned monitoring rounds for September and December, in which the Department secured an additional 82.5 million of funding primarily for Agenda for Change pay increases. The spring supplementary estimates are the final stage in the 1920 budgetary and legislative process and were presented to the Assembly for debate in February. Following that process, the Finance Minister then brought about Budget Bill NI 2020. This bill provided the legislative authority for the Executive's revised spending plans for the 1920 year as a result of the in-year monitoring adjustments I have described. So the final resource Dell budget position for the Department for 1920 is £6.15 billion. Turning then to the Department's 2021 resource budget forecast requirements, which is set out in Part B of, of your pack. The proposed budget outcome for health announced by the Finance Minister to the Assembly on the 31st of March is a settlement of £6.158.4 million which is an additional allocation of 399.6 million, which represents an increase of 4.7% on 1920 forecast expenditure. This available funding does not include the executive's proposed response to COVID-19, which is considered separately to this budget. Included in the proposed budget outcome are ring-fenced allocations of 259 million, 
which includes 160 million for Agenda for Change pay, as previously committed to by the executive, 81 million pounds for transformation, 5 million pounds for safe staffing, 1 million pounds for infected blood, and 11.7 million for mental health and severe deprivation. The outcome also included a non-ring fence general allocation of 140.7 million. As the department has worked through the budget outcome, we have continued to review and refine forecast cost requirements. Our assessment is that the resource budget outcome of an additional 399.6 million leaves a shortfall of 71.6 million against updated forecast inescapable costs of 471.2 million, which are set out in part B of your pack. The need to constrain transformation costs in light of the COVID-19 emergency to 44 million rather than the 81 million pound forecast reduces this shortfall to some 34.6 million. And whilst the reduction in transformation funding is not ideal, given that significant progress which has been made in recent years, it has been necessary given the significant bearing COVID-19 has on our ability to bring forward transformation at this challenging time. This funding gap is after reflecting a 72 million pound target for new savings measures in 2021. You will be aware that the department's financial plan assumed 77 million of 1920 savings, measures which would be recurrent in 2021, and in addition, 72 million of new measures would be delivered in 2021. At this time, it is estimated that only 26.5 million of the 1920 measures are recurrent, and to deliver a further 72 million of savings, cost reductions, and other measures in 2021 represents a significant risk. The current COVID-19 pressures significantly increase this risk, as there will be little opportunity to focus on and progress any savings measures. Turning to New Decade New Approach, the Minister of Finance, in his Budget 2021 statement to the Assembly on the 31st of March, was clear that the funding available to the Executive for allocation was insufficient to meet the priorities set out in New Decade New Approach. <clears throat> The proposed budget allocation does not, therefore, allow the Department to deliver on all of the further priorities set out in NDNA, for which an additional £169 million was estimated. It is also recognised that given the need to focus on COVID-19, there will be limited opportunity to progress NDNA priorities during the coming year. The current COVID-19 crisis poses further risks to the Department's financial position. The 2021 financial year is one with particular significant challenges, both in terms of forecast expenditure requirements for both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19, and in respect to savings, as I've previously mentioned. The Department of Health has been working closely with colleagues in our trust, the Health and Social Care Board, and the Public Health Agency to put in place a range of measures in order to protect the health of the people of Northern Ireland in the context of the COVID-19 emergency. The response to COVID-19 and its impact is a rapidly changing picture. The Department and Health and Social Care are acutely aware of the issues emerging and are working to ensure that every conceivable effort is being made to help people keep safe and protect staff. The Minister has been clear that funding pressures will not be an obstacle in taking forward what needs to be done. The Department welcomes the initial allocation of £205 million to respond to the COVID-19 emergency. The Department also acknowledges the further £150 million of funding held centrally for vital PPE across the public and other sectors. The Department will use this allocation to address identified pressures associated with the response to the COVID-19 emergency. It is anticipated that the Department will have significant additional funding requirements as we move through this pandemic as this rapidly evolving and fluid situation unfolds. We will continue to work closely with our Department of Finance colleagues to monitor funding requirements. I will now hand you over to Bridget to talk you through the capital budget. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Neela. Um, so the proposed capital allocation for the 2021 financial year is £295 million. Um, as you can see from the template provided, this will enable us to take forward those priorities that we regard as inescapable as well as continuing to progress our flagship project. It also leaves an amount of £27.6 available for allocation to other priorities. 
At this time, however, we are proposing to hold this funding pending further information on a couple of key uncertainties. Firstly, we've requested end of year flexibility of 48 million in relation to the Encompass programme. Should this not be made available, we will need to use the funding remaining to mitigate that pressure in order to ensure that this important programme can continue. Secondly, we'll need to manage the COVID-19 related risks to our capital spending. We're currently undertaking an assessment of this position, which may very well remain fluid for some time. Should capital funding remain available, we have a number of feasible options for investment. These include addressing pressures in our IT programme, providing additional funding for estate maintenance, and looking at investor based proposals that will reduce our future revenue requirements. Unfortunately, the known pressures in the capital budget for 21-22 would make it unwise for us to commence investment in any further significant projects in the absence of a confirmed allocation for future years. The COVID-19 situation would also make delivering significant spending on these projects in the 2021 financial year particularly challenging. Neela, Kira and I would be happy to take any questions you have on the information provided. Okay. Thank you all um, for that presentation. I suppose my first question is around the transformation, <clears throat> and it's been indicated that uh, it's, not, it's not even being potentially funded to stand still. Does that mean it's likely to be paused or go into reverse? Um, Chair, I'll take that question. It's Kira Dolan here. Um, obviously, it's, it's very regrettable that the um, funding that we need for all of the inescapable pressures um, isn't available for transformation at this time. Um, I think it would be fair to say that um, you know the transformation delivering together is still a priority for the minister. So um, the proposals that have been put forward to the minister for his consideration on um, progressing transformation at this time focus on maintaining the uh, um, work that has already been taken forward to date. But there is no doubt that the lack of funding available will mean that some um, uh, projects will have to be paused until further funding can be um, found. And can uh, Kira, what what other options were considered? And in light of the fact that transformation is where we seek to achieve longer term improvements that would lead to to better care in the community. So, what other options were considered rather than, other than pausing the transformation? Um, to, I think, sir, to to be fair, the. Um, the consideration on the uh, future direction of transformation will be considered um, when we have a space to do so after the um, the COVID issue. Um, really, the, the, the virus at the moment is having a significant burden on our ability to, to bring forward transformation um, in terms of the resources, including staff, and that we would need to do that. Um, and at the same time, COVID is having a, um, a big impact on our operating model as, as, as we are at present and, and, and how, we, how we deliver our services. So really what we'll need to do is take a step back and look at the um, situation that we're in after, the, after COVID to, to inform really what resources we need and um, how, we, how we take forward the transformation journey. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and that's something I think we'll want to keep an eye on. Um, can I also ask then about the, the, the inescapable pressures in February were indicated as being 322 million. That is now figure has now gone to 472 million, almost a 50% increase. Can you explain to us how that inescapable pressure figure has risen to that extent? Um, I'll pick that one up. It's Neela Lloyd here. Um, the information that you have in the 471.2 in the pack of information you have, there's only been um, quite a, a relatively small difference in the inescapable pressures in that information than what we would have brought to you in February time. Um, and it's, it's really to do with refining of, of estimations and refining of cost pressures. But I can confirm that there has been no significant movement to that um, level um, in terms of the inescapable pressures. Um, rather, they've just been some of them have been refined as more information has come to light um, in certain in certain areas. Um, but the the information that you have here, as presented, when we take into account the proposed budget settlement of 399.6 million, 
when set against the position that we reported in February, um, does leave us with that funding gap that we've set out here um, for you. But I can confirm that there hasn't been a movement in escape of pressures of that magnitude. Sorry, Anela, are you saying that there has been a, a move of that magnitude? Sorry, no apologies. I have not been clearer there, Chair. No, I'm saying there hasn't been a movement of that magnitude between the two sets of information, between the February position and the position today. Um, perhaps it's just one that um, we need to be clearer on whenever we are um, 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 can follow it up for you, um, if you like, Chair. But what I'm saying to you is there have been some refinements in costs from the, the, the two sets of information at the two points in time, but there hasn't been that um, significant a movement um, in total. Okay, well, I, I would like some more information. It seems significant to me. I, I don't know what I'm missing there exactly, but it's 150 million of an increase. I, I think, Chair, it's in the way the information has been presented to you between the two points in time, um, but I can confirm that when we take into account the proposed budget settlement of just under 400 million, that the, the funding gap that is here and the inescapable pressures that are here are uh, certainly the level of them here are 338.7 million. And um, the previous information you had on a like for like basis is 346.5 million. So there's been a very, very slight difference there. So I think it's just in the way it's being um, potentially um, um, compared. I'd be very happy to um, provide you with a, a breakdown of that. Yeah. That'll be useful. And the final one for me then before I go to members is, and, and the figures continue to rely on assumptions of recurrent savings. And I know you have addressed that within your presentation there, Neela, and you have in fact indicated that it's a significant risk. But what evidence is there of the likelihood of those being met? And what approach is planned should those savings targets not be met? Well, as I said, and, and you're right to say, there still is that risk as we have presented it in the latest information to you. Um, and what I can just say on that point is that that obviously has to be kept under very close review. Um, particularly, um, the risk was there, if you like, before COVID-19. And as I've highlighted, that is now um, serving to, if you like, um, perhaps increase that risk even further in terms of deliverability. So it's something that we would very much continue to monitor as a department. Um, but at this point, in order to... Um, live within the budget that we have been proposed um, we have to um, set aside a plan to ensure that um, trusts are, and, and others will um, have a savings target for 2021 but we're very cognizant of the fact that we will need to keep that under close review um, and to ensure that um, it can be delivered upon and if it can't be delivered upon that we have an alternative um, a way of, of, of living within the budget that we have to live within. Okay, and I think we will come back to that in terms of what that alternative might. That that's what I'm seeking information on is what that alternative might look like. So I think we will we will uh, welcome further information on that as well. So I'm going to uh, go to members now, and I have some indications in the room first, and then I'll go to the phone in the order we went previously. So um, I'll go first to Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one quick question. Um, am I right in saying there's a shortfall for this financial year of 72 million? And if so, what are you looking at in trying to um, recoup that in terms of um, what services are you looking at reducing or, or cutting or at the moment? Okay, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Yeah, um, Nina, is it? Yes, it is. Sorry, yeah. apologies. <laughs> Sorry, no, we're getting used to it. Go ahead. It's the voices, uh, yeah. Neela here, apologies. Um, so to address your question, no, we're not looking at a shortfall of 72 million in 1920 in, in terms of the, the, the outturn position, um, as I think is the question that the member posed. Um, we are saying that in 1920, there was savings targets set across the system of 72 million. Um, the, the figure of what we've achieved against that is some 61 million, but the point is that not all of that, and, and, and only 26, 0.5 million of that is actually recurrent and which is the point we've discussed as being at risk but getting back to your question on the 72 whilst there is um, 72 million pounds of savings have largely been delivered in 1920 so I would just like to confirm that we're not um, reporting a shortfall of 72 million in 1920 um, we're, we're obviously at this point in the year as you would expect um, looking at our um, provisional light term position as we're required to report to Department of Finance so we are um, closely monitoring the end of year position on resource 
and to ensure that we will um, deliver break even and live within the budget that we have. But just to clarify, there isn't a shortfall of 72 million in 1920. Can you hear that, Neil? Uh, apologies, no, I couldn't. What's the shortfall projected for this financial year? Um, in terms of 1920, we, we're not projecting a shortfall at all. For 1920, we're projecting that we will deliver um, break even and, and live within the budget that we have at this point in time. But as I said in the opening comments, um, that is particularly um, something we're looking at very closely at the moment, particularly in the context of COVID-19 and in the challenges that that's bringing um, as well in terms of um, the current financial year in terms of, of pressures and in terms of um, outcomes. But I can confirm we're not reporting um, at this point. We're not anticipating a shortfall in 1920. What about 2021? Uh, pardon, could you repeat that for me, please? What about 2021? 2021, um, when we take into account the proposed budget settlement and we take into account um, forecast savings, as we've discussed, and we take into account um, the position that's presented to you, that we're looking at this point of a funding gap of some 34.6 million um, in terms of 2021 um, at this stage. But again, um, I would say that, um, again, heavily caveated from the perspective of, um, you know, the inescapable costs and the quantum of those coupled with um, COVID-19 and the impact that that, that may have on our 2021 um, costs. Um, transformation Kira has mentioned, and of course the deliverability of savings. So at the point um, of having this discussion, the, the gap for 2021 um, is that 34.6 million in terms of our shortfall on, on maintaining existing services. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paula. Um, thank you, thank you ladies for the presentation this morning. It's um, in relation to the elective care waiting list. Um, in the note in the um, letter that was supplied to the chairperson of the committee around budgetary pressures, that you talked about an additional 30 million um, that is essential to meet the demands for elective care. And then in Annex A of the resource Dell budget, you talked about 50 million. I'm conscious that with this pandemic, um, irrespective of the private sector um, providing some elective care, um, that a lot of that surgery cannot go ahead at the minute. And I'm wondering how money within this financial year is going to be protected because we, we, may, we may well find um, in the last quarter of this year that that elective care can be ramped up and, and rightly so because of the poor health outcomes if we don't get to the patients. Thank you. Uh, Neely here. Um, I'll take that one, and then if Kira wants to contribute anything. Um, so, in terms of the elective care waiting list, the 30 million that you referred to, yes, we have included that in as an inescapable cost pressure um, to specifically control waiting times for red flag and urgent outpatient assessments and elective treatments. Um, and you know, as I said earlier, and as I said in the opening comments, again, in terms of the COVID-19 and the pandemic. I mean, this absolutely elective care waiting list remains an absolute key priority for the department, but the position will need to be kept under review, particularly um, as we continue to go forward with the, the COVID-19 situation. Lilia, no, I have nothing more to add on that, really, other than what you have picked up on, other than to say that um, the £44 million pound for transformation, you know, it will be for the Minister to consider how best to meet the priorities, the many committees competing priorities that he has across the department and how that that is allocated. Okay, thank you. I'm going to Jerry then and then I'm moving to the phones. Thanks, George. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just, just quickly before I ask two quick questions, uh, it does seem bizarre to me that we're asked to approve a, um, a budget before uh, in the context of a new decade, new approach uh, period and obviously we're in a, a totally different uh, scenario completely so it, it just seems ge generally strange to me. Um, um, and in terms of questions, um, has there been any work done in the department around uh, hazard pay? I know some councils have looked at this in terms of uh, paying staff um, a, an extra um, amount due to the work they're doing in the current period. So I, wa I want to ask, has any work been done, as far as you know, uh, from the department's end around hazard pay? Um, page 85 of the financial plan, uh, plan um, 
uh, I think it assumes there's going to be £50 million pounds of saving for trusts. Uh, that would be concerning if that's the case. Um, I mean, generally speaking, but especially in a context where we need to, uh, in my view, enhance our uh, health service at this time. So, can we get a bit more detail about those um, two points, please? Um, it's Neela here again. Um, certainly. Um, I'm afraid on the question of hazard pay, I'm not um, in a position to be able to, to answer that one, um, but I'm happy to, to take that question away and, and see if I can get a re response, if, if, if that was acceptable. Yep. Um, Thanks. Uh, your question then, or your, your comment in terms of page 85 of the financial plan, am I right to assume that's the commissioning plan that you've referred to? Um, I think so, you have to give me a second. <laughs> Apologies. No problem. It's on all, page 85 of our pack, so give me a second. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Table papers. Sorry, Chair. So that's page 16, I think, of your document. Nella. Okay, yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, okay, so yes, we're talking about the, the 50 million within the um, 2021. 20, um, target, yes. um, if I'm picking you up that's, right. That's correct. Um, Thank you. Yes, and so what we're saying um, in 2021, we will be um, after having a savings target of 72 million um, for new savings measures and cost reductions. Um, and it is expected that the, the trust element of that is around 50 million pounds. Um, that is um, not dissimilar to the um, savings target that was set in 1920. And I must apologise if I can go back to an earlier point. I think I misquoted the 1920 savings target as being 72 million in a previous answer. Apologies for that. It should, of course, have been 77 million. Um, so, in terms of the 50 million savings, um, yes, again, just to um, say that it is going to be um, potentially very challenging for the trust particularly as arguably some of the momentum may already be lost in terms of um, being able to start any work on delivering that, particularly in the context of COVID-19. But um, it is something that we will um, be very, very much keeping a very close eye on and keeping on to review as um, both the COVID-19 and indeed the non-COVID-19 expenditure profile becomes clearer as we move through 2021. It may be that you will see um, peaks in, in cost pressures in one area and, and dips, if you like, in cost pressures in another area. So as we um, robustly monitor the financial position of our um, trusts, um, we will be um, very much keeping a close eye on that and the deliverability of that. Um, sorry, guys, for your answer. Do we have any detail of that um, statement yet? There's still early days or is there an anticipation of where that will be? Um, I don't have the detail per trust because pe post the agreement of the budgets and the allocation of the, the budget through the Health and Social Care Board and onward allocation to the trust, um, it will be um, uh, part of that consideration um, as the um, Health and Social Care Board work through the detail of what the savings targets will be by individual trust. But um, in keeping with prior years, um, it is expected that they will be set an individual target. Um, to be recurrently delivered in 2021. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to the phone then. Pam, are you there? De Vice Chair Pam? Cameron? Yes, I am. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation, uh, ladies. Um, just two questions, really. I wanted to ask if there was an estimate of savings created by the currently suspended normal trust services. And the second, um, part would be really to ask you to go over again what you said about the Encompass programme. I didn't quite catch that. I wanted to hear what, what's happening with that and um, the possible impact um, of COVID-19 on that Encompass programme. Thank you. Okay, panel, please. I'm happy to take the Encompass question, Bridget Worth here. Um, so we were originally targeting a signing date of um, February 2020 for the Encompass contract. Um, unfortunately, um, we didn't meet that target. We decided that, that given the size of the programme, we need to take some additional time over the approval process um, to make sure that we're as confident as we can be for a project of this size, that we've done everything we can to ensure it's success. 
So we're now targeting um, May 2020 for signing of that contract, and that has meant that um, there's £48 million pounds of our capital budget in 1920, um, that has not been spent, and we are seeking end of year flexibility from the Department of Finance to carry that forward into 2020-21. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can I, it's Neela here again. I apologise, I didn't quite catch the first question. Could you possibly repeat that for me? Sure, yes, Neela. Uh, uh, to ask about if there is an estimate of savings created by currently suspended normal trust services. Are you talking about right in the here and the now by way of the COVID-19 impact? Yes. Yes. Okay, just to be clear. Um, there isn't an estimate of that. As you can imagine, the situation has been incredibly fluid um, over the last number of weeks. Um, and it, the 1920 savings that I referred to earlier on um, are the, the, the latest position that we have in respect of the deliverability of those. Um, but I, I think it's still the, the overarching point remains um, at, at the highest level, I guess, is that as we head into the early part of 2021, effectively where we are now, that we would begin to see the crystallisation of some of the um, change in some of the, the services and the impacts that they are having um, from a financial perspective. But I think um, at this point in time, we, we don't have um, the, the granular detail on that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Just as a follow-up to Pam's second part of Pam's question in relation to Encompass, and I suppose it is regrettable that there's a delay, given that it's quite an extended rollout period envisaged for, for the system. But it has been raised with committee here before in relation to Encompass, uh, including figures around children, and in maybe particular mental health and that, that we can record those figures. Will the delay allow for consideration of children to be included within Encompass? Um, Bridget here again. Um, Chair, sorry, I'm not um, across that level of detail of the Encompass programme. Um, certainly they are at the moment looking at what a reprofile for the programme will look like. They also need to take into account the impact of COVID-19 on the ability to progress that programme. And as you'll appreciate, there is extensive engagement required with clinical staff across the system to ensure that that um, system is meeting our needs and, and is designed to be the best it possibly can be and obviously those level of staff haven't been available during the current surge and obviously we need to take account of whether in um, future surge periods there may be um, lack of availability of staff there too so um, as I say I know the program is looking at what um, a reprofile would look like primarily in the light of, of the, the, the COVID situation. Okay, thank you. And I'm going back to the phone then to Orlea. Are you there, Orlea? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. Just um, around the mental health budget, um, and it says in your document that the, the, in the, the resource um, element of the budget, there was $11.7 million that was ring-fenced for mental health and deprivation. So I just wanted to ask, has this percentage, Chair, um, of the budget, has there been any increase on from this amount um, in comparison to previous um, budgets? Because I know we raised it, I think, with you in the past at a previous health committee meeting about, obviously, the, the, the um, percentage that goes towards mental health from the overall health budget has been historically low here, sitting in around 5 to 6%, if it's even reached 6%. So just on that, firstly, if there's been any increase um, on, on that amount that goes into mental health, and has any um, of the resource funds um, being put in place for the Protect Life Through Strategy um, and in relation to the capital funding projects, has there been any ring fencing of capital funds for important projects like the Hollywell Capital Build and the Perinatal Mental Health Unit? Because I'm just conscious in the last conversation we had with the Minister around COVID-19, now more than ever, we really need to be equipped um, with suitable facilities and services um, for uh, the day with people's um, mental health um, and uh, to hopefully save, save lives, particularly coming out of the other end of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelia. And our panel, please. Uh, okay, Celia here again. I'm happy to um, 
answer the questions on mental health. And um, Bridget, if you're happy, uh, maybe with care support. Sorry, I can help me with the Protect Life 2 strategy one. And then, Bridget, if you're content on the capital aspect. No problem. Um, so in terms of the question on mental health, and you specifically mentioned the 11.7, and just to be clear on that, that is money that we've got ring-fenced in 2021, um, £10 million pounds, uh, ring-fenced in our budgets for mental health which comes from a confidence and supply agreement um, and we're heading into year three of that. Um, so that is money that we've had um, in, the, in the last couple of years for mental health um, particularly and it's been ring-fenced for mental health um, and so this is the year three of that money. Um, in terms of the wider point in terms of mental health, obviously you know mental health continues to be a priority for the minister um, and you know we'll need to consider the mental health um, in terms of that in terms of that in the context of other priorities so we can um, fully understand what can be taken forward within the proposed budget outcome um, so um, you know you will also have seen in your pack that for 2021 we we have inescapable um, cost pressures identified of around 20 million for mental health and learning disability, which would be additionality um, if it was to be funded and allocated in that way in the context of other priorities. So um, the, 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 the 10 million plus um, arguably the 20 million that I've referred to in, in terms of that for 2021 um, um, provides um, uh, some additionality on what is already in the baseline for mental health. Um, so it, it adds a little bit, but uh, I, uh, it doesn't um, hugely at this point, you know, increase that 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 part of that, that budget that's there. Um, Kira, do you want to say anything in terms of the Protect Life Two strategy in the context of transformation? Um, Nelia, I suppose um, looking at transformation over the last two years, uh, there was a total, I think, of about 15 million allocated to. Um, mental health and different different elements of, of mental health and um, the the funding for mental health projects that are going to go forward again and i and, and sorry to repeat myself um, uh, to, to, to the members of the committee but the uh, decisions around the 44 million will be taken by the minister um, in consideration of the numerous priorities that there are across the system um, and, and, and how far that 44 million pounds will go for transformation this year Okay, thank you. Is that um, is, is there a further element to our latest question? Someone. Yes, question? sorry, sorry, Chair um, Bridget Worth here just to answer the point around the capital. Um, and firstly, on Hollywell, on the Northern Mental Health Provision, um, we have specified um, some funding in 2021 for um, the to commence the design work on the Northern Mental Health. Um, we are currently in the final stages of business case approval on that. Um, and I know trust staff, I'm sure, have been um, trying to get working on that alongside dealing with the COVID pressures. Um, but um, we are hoping that that business case will progress to approval relatively shortly and that will enable us to spend the funding that we have set aside in 2021 on commencing that project. Okay, and just uh, again a follow-up to that. Sorry, the yeah. last one was on the, the perinatal mental health unit. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, Olia. Um, so on the perinatal mental health, I know that planning has, uh, and that, that there's some work being done looking around, looking at what that might look at, look like. But I don't, I, uh, I haven't yet received um, a, a, a proposal on the capital front for that as yet. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Arlea. And just a, a, a linked question in relation to the capital funding, Bridget. Um, Department of Finance March briefing stated that 15 million for the McGee Medical School is increasingly likely, unlikely to be spent in 2021. What's the position within the Department of Health on that, and what's what's happening with that project and that that money? So um, the capital element of the McGee Medical School. Um, is not something that the department has been considering. We have been looking at the workforce aspect and the um, revenue funding side of that. Um, the construction of a uh, further education facility for that is not something the department has currently been considering. I, I know there's been some engagement with colleagues in the Department of the Economy around that, but, but we 
haven't been considering the capital side of that proposal. So on the revenue side of it then, the 15 million revenue, that's the workforce element, is it? The workforce revenue, 15 million? Um, Neela here again, sir. Yep. Um, the 15 million you're referring to is um, towards the resource cost of McGee Medical School. Yep. Um, and when the, 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 the actual 2021 um, resource element for the Department of Health is estimated to be something like a hundred thousand pounds, which are really just some preliminary costs associated with the project. Um, and then of course it ramps up over a ten year period to some twenty five million recurrently. So in year one, twenty twenty one, we had a requirement of just as I said about a hundred thousand um, and it was under the, the one of the NDNA priorities. Um, so, um, as I said, a very small amount in year, but appreciating that it does ramp up over a ten year period. Um, so, um, I know colleagues in the department who have policy responsibility are doing some work in this area, um, and so uh, I'd be happy to um, perhaps take some of that back to them for further consideration. But from a pure financial perspective, um, we had a small amount um, required, required. being required in 2021, um, which would, would kickstart us um, in terms of this department. Well, I suppose my concern emanating from that is if there's delays within the Department of Economy on the capital elements of the project, will the money be protected and ring-fenced within, within your revenue budget for McGee? And, and that's in light of a very serious crisis west of the band generally in primary care, and this is seen as, a major, uh, as, a, as one of the major building blocks to repair and protect the, the primary health care in the west. So will will the money be will the money be reinforced and protected and kept within the department? The money that we, we this is an NDNA commitment and um, for which this is one of those areas where well, sorry, it was just a bit of feedback there, apologies. Um so this was money that was under the NDNA umbrella, if I call it that, um, which we had identified as part of our 169 million, um, for which we would estimate was our requirement to take forward those priorities. Um, and as I said in my opening comments, we haven't received any money um, from um, in that regard in terms of 2021 for that particular area, and indeed for the other areas that we have we have as being um, priorities under NDNA. So at this point, um, our the Department of Health share of that we haven't got yet um, in terms of that, even if it's a small amount. But the executive paper. Um, in terms of the 15 million for NDNA, um, I think that is being held centrally. It's, it's one probably from a referred Department of Finance colleagues, pending discussion with um, Treasury on reprofiling. Okay, thank you. And I'm going back to the phone now to Colin. Are you there, Colin? Yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Um, sir I, I'm, I'm not entirely satisfied with that answer about the game, and it's certainly not down to the, the presentation it's given. I think. It just seems somewhat that the development of McGee Medical School is just getting sucked into a process between finance, health, executive, secretary of state, and we're not getting uh, concrete answers. Notwithstanding, I think it's either in the report or was referred to earlier by the minister that um, if the monies can't be spent this year, and I think there was reference to 15 million, then it would have to either be handed back or an agreement made. Um, with the exchequer about being able to hold that money and carry it over. So I don't know how we can hand back money that we don't have. And, and it's that type of confusion, um, which I don't think is, 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 is helping the case. And maybe as a recommendation, we could have a separate agenda item um, in the next couple of weeks about the issue uh, of McGee Medical School and somebody can actually come in and tell us the actual way of it so that we know exactly where we stand and where the monies are going back and forward. And maybe just in, in light of um, something along the, the same lines of confusion, I was wondering if the, uh, the, the, the panel could give me some help. We, we, I've been trying very hard with others in the community to get uh, an MRI scanner at the Down Hospital in St. Patrick. Now, when we go to the trust, they say that they need the money from the board. When we go to the board, they say they need a business case. You go back to the trust for the business case, they say they send it to the board. The board then say that they need the approval from the department to get the money. And then when you go to the department, they say that it's nothing to do with us, it's the board and the trust that needs to sort it out. Now, this has been rumbling on for years. Uh, and what I was hoping to do now is that if we can start right at the top of the tree in this setting, could, could the panel tell me what they feel in terms of capital projects? Do they hand the money to the board and then the board decides how it's spent, or is it a ministerial decision, 
or is it a trust decision and how does the money follow through? Thank you. Um, I'll take that one. It's Bridget here. So, um, in developing some proposals for capital, um, and in fact, in developing the plans that you've seen see in front of you in, in this paper, um, my team engaged heavily with colleagues in the trust and the board to bring forward proposals for investment. Mm -hmm. um, we then take those proposals for investment. We have um, convened a series of um, review groups which um, were led by policy colleagues in the department but also comprised relevant members from the board, um, including commissioners where relevant, um, to put some priorities around that. Um, and that's how we've come up with, with the programme that you see in front of you. And as, as you say, that then is put to the minister as a recommendation for the minister to endorse or, or otherwise. Um, so that's broadly the process we, we've gone through to arrive at these capital proposals. Um, once a project is approved, we then require a um, business case to be prepared. Um, depending on the size of that business case, that then requires the department's approval. It requires, on occasion, the Department of Finance's approval. And any revenue consequences attached to that business case have to be approved by the Health and Social Care Board so that we're not um, opening a facility that we can't afford to operate or planning to build a facility that then we can't afford to open and operate. So um, hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavour of, of, of how, how the process works. Um, it certainly highlights why I'm confused by the process. There's quite a number of levels and quite a number of... Um, uh, sort of processes are. Can, can you tell me then, maybe from from your uh, understanding, where the case for the um, MRI scanner at the Down Hospital is in that process that you've just outlined? Certainly. Um, so the, the the scanner was certainly submitted as one of our capital proposals. Um, it hasn't um, reached high enough priority at the moment due to limited capital budgets for us to be in a position to fund it in the immediate future. Um, so in that, in those cases, um, we would be saying to trust, we, we, we would actually say to trust um, business cases, um, once we get a business case approved by the Department of Finance, there's normally a shelf life on it. They normally, there's normally a condition of approval that says if you're unable to start this project within 24 months, um, you effectively have to resubmit a revised business case. So where, where there isn't a prospect of us being able to fund a project within a reasonable period of time, we would be saying to the trust, look, it wouldn't necessarily be wise for you to be going through the process and putting the effort and resource into producing a business case when we're looking at the capital projections, looking at the likely amounts of money we're going to get over the next number of years. And it doesn't look like, like that's something that, that we will have funding for in the next couple of years. Um, obviously, if the capital funding position changed, um, we, we would reopen that prioritization and look at what else we might be able to bring forward. But, but for me, it really is about making sure that we are focusing our effort on those projects that we, we have funding for and trying to move those on as quickly as we can. Okay, I'm going to move. Sure, just, uh, Colin, just Colin, no, no, I'm, I'm going. I'm going to move on. I, I, I suggest that you bring that. I, su I suggest that you bring that up as a as a direct issue, maybe with the department in relation to the the constituency specific bit. I'm happy to take questions on the general processes. So I want to give everyone a fair chance there. So I'm going to go to Pat now at this stage. Uh, sir, I'm just going to wait until the next time officials come in. If that's okay with you. Yeah. That's okay. Well, then, just in relation to, to Colin's overall question there, um, and regarding clear line of sight and following uh, these financial decisions through from the HSE, through, the, through all the processes right into the trusts, the department has said that it's progressing implementation plans for the review of financial processes. Can you explain to us how that's being done, what progress is being made, and you know, what the next steps are in that, pro in that process? Uh, it's nearly here again. Yes, um, So that's in, in the clear line of sight and review of financial process. Yeah. So yes, what we are doing um, and what all departments are doing is is following the executive um, request to um, bring in clear line of sight as it was formerly known. 
um, which really is designed to ensure that from an account estimate and budget perspective that the, um, there's, there's, there's transparency, if, if you like, in terms of, of the, the flow of the money and the reporting of that, um, because of the minister done in arguably potentially three slightly different ways. So that's the, the backdrop of the project. Um, there is a, a, a time frame associated with the project, and um, we are working through that. Um, and there are certain deliverables that have to be met within that, such as drive on accounts. Um, to be prepared, which we have done um, already um, for in terms of 18, 19 accounts, so, and there's estimates um, have been prepared to a certain basis as well. But they're all in in sort of dry run and in in that kind of um, development stage, if I call it that. So we're following a schedule that has been set out ultimately um, through Department of Finance, and we are currently working to that schedule, and with the the view that by 21-22 will be the year whenever review of financial process is rolled out and we have consolidated accounts done on that basis. So that is currently um, the direction of travel. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, listen, as, as I said earlier, we recognise that, that everyone is working within significant pressure um, in relation to the situation with COVID-19 and all of that. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and your answers today, but I think it's clear that, that members need more time than has been provided to just uh, go through the figures and and sort of pull, pull those apart. So we would welcome if you could provide someone next week to, to do a follow-up session in relation to this. But for now, I wish you all the best and thank you very much for your presentation here today. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay, members. Thank you. So, members, now we do need to take another short break just to get our next uh, witness on the line. So, can I suspend the meeting for 10 minutes? Come back at 13.10 there? Sure, sure, this is for you. I suggested in that segment of the uh, meeting that we would maybe get a special item on the agenda for the McGee College uh, Medical School. Is that, uh, something, is that something that we propose in this year? Can I make that a proposal? Well, yeah, and you can bring that up, I think, in forward work programme um, may be the best place to do it, Colin. Would that be? Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, we'll thank be coming to forward work, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chair, just before you go, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to have to leave now. Apologies okay. for that. Okay. Uh, thank thanks for thanks for that, Pat. Okay. Thank you. 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 Members, we are considering today uh, and the draft an SL1, the draft Children's Social Care Coronavirus Regulations 2020. I refer members to tab 8.1 of your pack. The department is proposing to make a statutory rule to provide HSE trusts and independent providers of children's social care services with some flexibility to continue to provide essential services to look after children children in need and care leavers during the surge period of the coronavirus pandemic. This will involve relaxing existing legislative requirements to support the contingency arrangements contained in the HSE Board's Children's Social, Ser Social Care Services Surge Plan. The Department advises that no public consultation or impact assessments have been carried out due to the urgent nature of this SR. The Department intends that regulations will come into operation shortly in breach of the 21-day rule and will be subject to negative resolution. The proposed SR will impact on care arrangements for, the vulnerable, for vulnerable children and has been introduced at short notice. I can advise members that officials from the Department are here today via teleconference to provide members with further information on the proposed SR and to address any concerns or questions that members may have. So I would now like to welcome Ms Eilish McDaniel, Director of Family and Children Policy, and Ms Julie Stevenson, Head of Adoption and Children Bill Team. So I'd like to ask you now to go ahead and make your presentation to the committee, please. Okay, thank you, um, Chair. It's, it's Eilish here, so I, I'll make a start with, a, with, with an opening um, statement. I want to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to brief the committee um, on the draft and regulations, and if members are content, I'll provide you with an overview of the purpose and the effect of the regulations, what we're doing and why. And following that, and both Julie and I will be able to and happy to take any questions that members may have. 
We did provide members with the um, SL1 notification outlining the legislative effective regulations. Guidance to support the proposed changes is also being um, drafted, and that draft can be shared, shared with the committee in advance of the regulations being made, if members would find that helpful. The regulations make urgent temporary modifications to eight different sets of children's social care regulations. We're seeking to relax certain statutory requirements for two reasons. The first is to enable HSE Trust to work more flexibly during the COVID-19 pandemic period, but also to ensure the Trust has sufficient flexibility as children and families begin to emerge from lockdown. There is a real risk and that there will be serious pressures on family and children's services whenever that happens. We know, for example, that referrals to children's services are down from sources like schools, healthcare professionals and family relatives. There is a risk that trusts will have to deal with a surge in referrals when they return to business as usual. By enabling trusts to work more flexibly um, during or after the pandemic, I want to assure members that it will not be at the expense of keeping children safe or at a risk to their welfare. However, the reality is we have services that were under pressure before the pandemic occurred and with issues like staff absence due to illness and or the requirement to self-isolate and social distancing requirements, those pressures have been exacerbated. The changes to the regulations that we're proposing will not result in any of the statutory functions of trust being removed. As indicated, they're temporary. They're being made to introduce flexibility within services and will be undone at the earliest opportunity. They will, in the main, permit those functions to be undertaken within longer timescales or in different ways using technology to make and keep contact with families where it's appropriate. We want to ma maximise flexibility, and by that we mean to both flex up and flex down, to be able to relax timescales and to tighten them if necessary. And as a result, trust will be required by modified regulations and act in accordance with departmental guidance. However, the changes which relate to secure care will be specified in regulations. This means that if we wanted to make any further changes in terms of requirements as it relates to secure care, this could only be done by way of further amending regulations, which would be subject to scrutiny by the committee. The reason for the difference in approach to secure accommodation is that the deprivation of a child's liberty, um, members will appreciate, is among the most serious interventions possible and requires to be stipulated in legislation rather than guidance. In addition to the modifications relating to secure care, the mod modifying regulations contain provision relating to visits by social workers to look after children and children placed for adoption, monitoring visits by registered providers to children's homes, reviews of children's cases and pathway plans for care leavers, foster care approvals and reviews, and pr the procedure for handling representations, including complaints under the children order. As I've already indicated, um, the guidance, which will specify altered time scales and adjusted ways of working, is being drafted and drafts of the guidance have been shared with the Health and Social Care Board and Trust for comment. The guidance will sit alongside other departmental guidance on the operation of children's social care services during the pandemic, including guidance for children's homes, foster care, daycare, and support accommodation for young people. As service issues have arisen over the last few weeks, guidance has been updated and reissued. For example, children's homes um, guidance has been updated to deal with issues like the use of PPE, testing, and the challenges linked to self-isolation. In the guidance linked to the regulations under consideration by the committee today, we place a strong emphasis on the importance of continuously assessing the needs of children and young people and any potential risks associated with the changes in practice or service provision. And where a statutory duty has been relaxed, robust risk management plans will be required, and this is stipulated in the draft guidance. So, for example, where a child is not being visited in person, or a review is not being carried out within the usual time frame, any risks that might arise as a, result, uh, as a result are expected to be considered and mitigations put in place to deal with them. Risk assessments and risk management plans will be child-specific. I've already indicated the temporary nature of the modifying regulations. It's intended that they will cease to have effect six months after the come the operation. And the department does have the party extend that period if it's considered necessary. But such an extension will require a further set of regulations to be made, and as a result, members of the committee will be advised uh, at that point and briefed, if necessary, on the reasons why an extension is being sought. If you're content, I will now provide members with a little more detail on the purpose and effect of the regulations. Um, we're amending three sets of regulations to remove the prescribed time scales for undertaking visits to look after children placed at home with their parents, children in foster care, and children who have been placed for adoption. Instead, visits will be undertaken in accordance with departmental guidance. 
not guidance will stipulate that visits to children um, should be prioritised. Certain groups of children will be deemed to be a priority and they include children and young people um, suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. Um, children requiring an emergency looked after child placement. Looked after children and young people at risk of placement breakdown. Children with a disability, including those with high support needs or complex care packages. And finally, vulnerable um, young people with less care and are known to 14 plus services or leaving the aftercare, uh, or leaving an aftercare services. The guidance will state that where a visit is deemed necessary, the child should be visited in the home in which they've been placed or are living as soon as it's safe to do so. And where visits in person are not considered necessary, contact with the child or young person um, will be maintained remotely uh, using technology as appropriate. So, for example, contact could be maintained by phone, by email, by text using um, technologies like FaceTime and, and, and Zoom as an example. And under an arrangement which does not involve a visit in person, social workers will routinely assess and monitor the well-being of the children involved. If concerns arise about an individual child, um, the child will be visited in line with public health guidance. We're amending the Children's Homes regulations um, from 2005 to change how monthly monitoring visits by registered providers are undertaken. And again, visits will be undertaken in accordance with the department's guidance, taking account of social distancing requirements and with the aim of reducing footfall in the home. Visits to homes will be replaced with contact arrangements using remote communication methods. And using those methods, interviews with children, with parents and staff will still take place. This will require a degree of planning and that will be the responsibility of the registered and provider. These requirements will be stipulated in the departments and guidance. Frequency of contact with the home by the registered provider will not change, and also reports based on that contact will continue to be produced and submitted to the RPIA. By way of modifying regulations, the timescales will undertaken taken after children's reviews and reviews of pathway plans for care leavers will be adjusted and set out in guidance. Reviews will continue to be required. However, in current circumstances and in potential future circumstances, we're permitting them to be undertaken in longer timescales. Also, we will give social workers and personal advisors the scope to conduct reviews remotely. The regulations will allow the first week after child review um, to be delayed and by up to four weeks, that's from two um, to six weeks, and the second review by up to three months, that's from three to six months. The aim will be to return to normal timescales as soon as staffing levels and social distancing requirements permit. For after children accommodated on short breaks, we're proposing to state in the guidance of the current timescales for review. That, that is an initial review at three months, followed by sub subsequent reviews every six months should continue to apply. Two reasons for that. Um, firstly, during the pandemic period, this service, um, which is primarily used by um, children with a disability, has been scaled back to only a small number of cases. And that's to minimise the, uh, the risk of uh, in infection spread among this particularly vulnerable group and also to reflect staffing pressures. Secondly, um, we consider that the current time scales are sufficiently long. However, um, if such cases will continue to be, they will continue to be monitored, and if the position changes, the guidance can be updated to provide for extended time scales if required. Although we're removing the requirement to review a young person's pathway plan every six months and stipulating and guidance that this should take place every nine months, there are two important conditions that remain in place. A review must take place um, sooner if either the young person requests one or if their personal advisor considers that it's necessary. Approval of foster cares will be able to proceed even if a full enhanced disclosure certificate is still outstanding, um, provided a trust receives confirmation from access and either the individual and any adult members of the household are not included in the children's barred list established under the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Order of 2007. And the purpose of this change is to enable foster carers to be assessed more quickly during the pandemic period. This is consistent with the approach being taken for those working in places like children's um, homes by way of regulations that were made by the Department on the 2nd of, of, of April 2020. We're also taking the opportunity to make a technical amendment to paragraph 9 of Schedule 1 to the foster placement um, regulations by correcting an outdated legislative reference to the re Rehabilitation of Offenders Order. So that will be an amendment rather than a, than a modification and it will continue to apply after the emergency period. The requirement to undertake reviews to foster parents and their households within a year will be temporarily suspended, although there's an expectation set out in the guidance that they will take place as soon as practicable. And such a review normally involves the foster care social worker making contact with the child social worker, the child and the foster care annually. And this may prove difficult during the emergency period due to staff absences or sickness. 
uh, and, and for social distancing and waiting. However, while the review um, may not um, take place within the year, trusts and independent fostering providers will continue to have the power to terminate a foster placement if they're no longer satisfied that a foster parent or any member of their household are deemed um, uh, suitable. And this will apply regardless of whether a review has taken place. The maximum duration for an emergency placement of a child with an approved foster parent will be extended from 24 hours to 14 days. And this will enable any child placed in an emergency to remain in that placement for the duration of any possible period of self-isolation if that is required. The maximum duration of an immediate placement of a child with a relative or friend before approval of the placement is required and will be extended from 12 weeks to 20 weeks. Also, the pool of individuals with whom a child can be placed in immediate circumstances will be extended to include approved prospective adopters and registered childminders, in addition to relatives and friends of the child. And I should make it clear that these two groups of people, that's childminders and prospective adopters, will already have been through a robust approval process. With the agreement of the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service and the Department of Justice, the maximum period beyond which a child may not be kept in secure care without the authority of a court will be increased from 72 hours to 96 hours, that's three days to four days. This extended period will only apply to children and young people placed in secure care after the regulations come into operation. Also, the minimum number of um, people who must review the placement of a child in, in secure care during the pandemic will be reduced from three to two. And we have reduced the number to ensure that reviews are more likely than not to take place. The timescales for reviewing a case of a child in secure care will also change. The first review remains unchanged. That is, it must be conducted um, within one month of the child's placement in secure care. However, we have extended the timescale for subsequent reviews from every three months to every four months. Finally, then, um, we will amend the Representations Procedure Children um, Regulations of 1996 to enable us to stipulate a revised timescale for the different stages of the complaints procedure under the Children Order. Complaints and representations will continue to be made, but the time frames for each stage of the process will be lengthened to provide trust with more flexibility during the emergency and period. So, for example, the local resolution stage will be required to complete within 28 days rather than 14 and we're advised that the majority of cases are resolved at local level and we therefore expect that the number of cases impacted by the changes um, will actually be quite low. That concludes the overview um, of the regulations. In terms of next steps, um, then, we started the process of considering possible changes to children's legislation more than five weeks ago. Such as the nature of making legislation, it, it has taken us until this time to advise the committee However, conscious of the passage of time, we have asked directors of children's services in recent days whether the proposed changes to regulations continue to be required, and unanimously they have agreed that they are. Directors are concerned that the current downturn in referral numbers will lead to increased pressure on services at the other end of the pandemic period, and have started to plan for that possibility. Other jurisdictions of the UK have already made similar changes to legislation or in, are in the process, a process of doing so. Um, as has the Republic of Ireland. We're near to finalising the drafting of the regulations. Um, due to the urgency, we want to be able to bring them into operation at the earliest possible opportunity. And for this reason, we're not intending to comply with the usual 21-day rule. And I think, Chair, you reflected that in your opening um, remarks. We will advise the examiner of statutory rules um, of this and, and of our reasons for non-compliance. If it can end on a positive note in the midst of the crisis that we're attempting to deal with by way of changes to regulations, I've been advised by trust directors of children's services that the majority of children in care have never been more settled. This is partly due to the lack of movement in and out of their homes, a reduction in the number of visitors to their homes, and the time um, for staff to work very creatively um, with them using methods and technologies w which appeal to children. Social workers likewise are enjoying the time and space to solidify their relationships with um, children in care. Directors have agreed to capture the learning from this crisis period and to potentially continue to work in new found ways when we're hopefully um, out the other end. Um, very happy at this um, stage, Chair, to take any questions um, from members. Okay, thank you for that presentation, Eilish. I have a couple of things before I go to members. Um, it's only about a year ago since there were serious concerns raised about a lack of regulation and inspection of some supported accommodation. <clears throat> in fact, that led to a judicial review and a call for more regulation and monitoring within some settings. 
Um, and I suppose I should declare an interest that I have previously worked as a social worker within this, this sphere of work myself. And I understand the importance of reviews and timely reviews and reviews being in calendars in order to ensure that no vulnerable child is being forgot about or, or is being left at risk of, of further vulnerability or further harm. But at the time of that a year ago, the RQIA described the lack of regulation as problematic and they said the department should review its legislation with a view to increasing regulation and inspection. So what reassurance can the department give that this relaxation of minimum standards will not leave vulnerable children even more vulnerable? Um, I, I appreciate your, your remark about um, supported accommodation, and that is something um, that we have been working with the RQA on. Um, Chair, I just want to assure you of, of that, and we, 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 we've agreed an arrangement um, that will be piloted over, over a, a period of time with a view potentially to introducing um, regulation for um, supported accommodation. So I just want to put um, that on record. In, in terms of um, how we ensure that children and young people are kept safe, um, as a result of, uh, well, in consequence of, of, of us relaxing um, the regulations, particularly around um, visits and, and reviews. I mean, I've said in my opening remarks that everything will be subject um, to risk assessment. Everything will be subject to ongoing um, review and monitoring um, by um, social workers overseen um, by their um, team leaders and heads of um, service. Um, and, and where situations change and where risks um, arise, um, our expectation is uh, that social workers and the guidance makes, make, makes this abundantly clear. Social workers will act and will act um, quickly um, to address any risks um, as and when they arise. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the other things you mentioned was that um, reviews, one of the circumstances within which reviews would take place sooner is if the young person requests one. Uh, no, I know the word. Yeah, that, that's in relation to um, pathway plans. Um, so we have uh, really, uh, relaxed that time scale by three months. That those pathway plans should be reviewed um, within six months under current regulations, and we're extending that to nine months. But um, the bits of the regulations that actually indicate that that a, a, a young that they will happen at a stage when a young person um, either requests it or when a when a, a, a personal advisor thinks that it's actually necessary. Those bits of the regulations um, will not be modified at all. They, they will stay in place. Yeah, and I think it's important just to note there that sometimes the difficulty is the young person doesn't have a voice and needs the adult to speak up for them. So I think you've, I think you've addressed that OK. Um, one other thing then in relation to pathway planning. We're very aware, I think, that there is something of a cliff edge for, for young children and, and young adults leaving care and going into going into other services. Can we be assured that no young person will be discriminated or will lose services as a result of these extensions, but that the service they currently have will be maintained through, to, throughout the extended time frames? So that services are not withdrawn preemptively as a result of delays. That's what I'm asking. Hello. Hello, can you hear me there, Eilish? So I'm asking about care leavers, young 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 people leaving care. Okay, I think I think I think they've lost you for a bit there. I'm okay, sure I'll, I'll repeat. Can you, can you hear me now, Elish? I can indeed. Yeah. Apologies. Okay, so listen, there is there is a fairly well recognised problem that many care leavers face something of a cliff edge leaving care and going out into adult adult services. I'm asking, can you assure us that no young person? will lose out on services as a result of these reviews being delayed, which is obviously not their fault. So I'm asking that, that there be a guarantee that services will remain in place until the reviews are carried out. So in addition to, I mean, there are a number of things that we've been doing um, uh, throughout um, this crisis period, um, Chair. So one of the things um, is about making um, changes to um, regulations to uh, introduce a degree of um, flexibility. I've talked about the guidance, etc., that we've put in place. But in addition to that, we've looked at other support measures that actually can be put in place to help those that are particularly um, vulnerable. Um, among those um, things that we're doing is the development of what we're calling a vulnerable children um, plan. Um, and within that plan, um, care leavers um, will be um, treated as a priority group or a group that will require um, additional support. And we have been working um, with the Health and Social Care Board 
um, to consider what those additional supports for car leavers um, might actually um, be. And the intention is um, to put a bit of investment into additional um, supports for, um, for, for car leavers, if, if that provides you with any level of assurance. Yes, well, it does. It does, but I, but I would also like you to take back the fact that no one should be, no one should have services removed in the absence of a review having been completed. What I'm saying is they may cross the the, the, the criteria in terms of age, but because a review hasn't been conducted, the new plan is not in place. So I'm saying that the, the trusts should be required to maintain the level of service they are until the review is is agreed. And and, and chair, what, what we can do is we can actually um, include that in the guidance. If that, if, if that gives you a level of insurance. Yes, thank you. One other item before I go then. You mentioned at part of your presentation that there was, you'd, I think you said something along the lines of you'd taken the opportunity to make an amendment of something that was kind of outdated. Uh, I think 9.1 was mentioned, but it was, it was to do with some criminal law or some phrasing. Can you run that yes, past yes. me again? Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a reference, um, an outdated reference in one set of um, regulations, um, Chair, and it's a reference to the Rehabilitation of Offenders um, order. Um, the intention would just be to um, update that um, to, to, to correct what is in fact incorrect uh, currently. We're just using the opportunity um, to do that. It's a technical um, change. It has no significant um, effect um, at all. It, it's just using an opportunity presented to us. Well, my observation in relation to that is that while the committee does acknowledge that there are some things here that need to be done and time, time frames curtailed and normal processes truncated, we wouldn't be keen that, this, that the opportunity would be taken to update things in the middle of all that. We, we would want that to be, if there are updates to be done, that those should come through the normal processes, if you like. Uh, in this occasion, they may not be significant, but I certainly would want to indicate that we wouldn't want um, tidying up to take place. If, if there's emergency things to be done, we consider that. But any, any other sort of more routine stuff, I think, should be coming through the normal process. OK, Chair, we, we, we will remove that from the draft regulations and then and, and bring it forward at, at a later stage. OK. OK, I'll go then. I have two indications in the room and then I'll go to the phone. So first of all, if Paula. OK, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I have two, two questions. The first one relates to children with um, disabilities. Um, you had mentioned there around home visits or, or virtual visits. The question really relates to the um, when they were in structured schools and, and um, day centres, they would have had access to allied health professionals like physiotherapists or speech, ther speech and language therapists. How is that being accommodated? I'm conscious that th that might have an impact not just on their physical but also their mental health coming through this. And the second one relates to the comment you made on sorry on care homes. I have two children at home, and I saw last night I think they were reaching the very end of their tether. Um, so I'm just conscious you said they're doing well at the minute um, because of the creativity of the staff. So is any additional funding being given to the homes so that they can continue to keep their interest and their um, their spirits up during this time? Thank you. OK, so I, I'm not, not absolutely clear on the point about um, allied health professionals and, and their continued contact um, children with a dis disability. But, but that's certainly something um, that I will um, ask of the relevant policy um, officials and, and bring that back to committee, to committee if, if that is OK. And one thing that I will say on that point is that we are working closely with the Department of Education um, as a result of the closure of special schools. And um, we've agreed with the Department of Education um, that we will actually um, establish a multi-agency um, arrangement involving education professionals and um, social work professionals, public health um, professionals, who will undertake a risk assessment of individual um, children um, as a result of them being out of um, special school um, with a view to put a, potentially putting an alternative um, arrangement uh, in place. So I just want to assure you that that work um, is underway at, at, at the minute. In, in terms of um, care homes, um, I, I mean, I, I received a piece from one of the directors of, of social services um, this morning in, in the Western um, Trust, and certainly um, there has been a lot of work done in individual um, homes um, to try and occupy children, etc., in this very difficult um, time. And I can, I can imagine that children being um, locked up um, at home at, at the minute is, is, is incredibly difficult um, for them indeed. So one of the things that she described to me, for example, was that um, they have purchased 
um, equipment for um, gardens, etc., that they can that, that, that they can use um, to get them out of outside of the physical um, building. They have purchased things like televisions um, for their um, for, for their individual um, rooms, etc., in, in the knowledge that this is a very difficult um, time. Um, I, I'm assuming um, that that kind of um, arrangement has been going on um, across um, all of our trusts and, and all of our uh, and all of our homes. Point. Was, was there additional funding being allocated, or are they having to find that within their own budgets? Um, uh, certainly, the department hasn't been asked for funding um, to meet those uh, those particular um, costs. And we, we did um, originally um, make an allocation, just an initial allocation, um, to um, foster households. So there was a one hundred pounds actually allocated. Um, to every foster care household in Northern Ireland at the start of um, the crisis um, period, again, to enable foster carers to, bu to buy some um, materials, etc., that would occupy um, children um, at, at home. We're working um, with the board at the minute, um, looking at how we might further support um, foster carers. And, and one of the options that we're looking at, taking account of the fact that children that are at home, it's going to require more in terms of um, feeding them, in terms of light and heat and, uh, and power. So what we're looking at is the possibility of, 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 of us actually increasing the fostering um, allowance over the course of the um, next um, 12 weeks. So that, that is under active um, consideration just at the minute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jerry. Thanks for the presentation. Um, two questions. Uh, can you explain the foster care uh, approval uh, and reviews uh, changes uh, with the guidelines? I, I know you said it, but I didn't uh, quite uh, grasp with the technicalities of the changes that will be in place uh, with, with regards to the SR coming in. Um, and just a, a general question: um, UNICEF have, have warned about the potentiality uh, of sort of abusive behaviour and neglect increasing in this time. Is there any grasp or sense of whether that's been the case? And, and if so, what, what can be done about that? OK, so starting with your, your initial question about foster care um, approvals. Uh, uh, when a foster care is, is, is approved, um, that approval has to be reviewed um, within um, the following um, year. So a, a review is, takes place um, once per year subsequent to the initial um, uh, approval. All that we've done by way of the regulations is to say that um, it is not necessary um, for that um, to be done within the year, but within the guidance we're saying very clearly um, that our expectation is that um, that review will be undertaken um, as, practicable, as soon as practicable, um, essentially. So as, as soon as the resources are there to do it, um, the review will be undertaken. It's not that they, are, they will not um, take place um, at all. I've referred to um, a safeguard that we um, kept within um, that system. Eilish, it, 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 Eilish, just a second, Jerry wants to clarify. Sir. Thanks, Sherry. Sure. Just to clarify, so it'll be assumed it'll be a quicker process then, yeah? Um, not, not necessarily. I'm not saying that it will be quicker. I'm saying it will will take place, but it may it will not take place or may not take place um, within the year. OK. Which, which, is, which is the requirement. OK, going then to check with the phones, and I'll just check in reverse order from the last two sections, so I'll go to Colin first, Colin McGrath. Yes, Chair, can I just check, maybe um, it's maybe more with the clerk rather than with the presenters. Do we have, um, have we had papers on these changes? Yeah, Eilish. Yeah, they're in table, um, well, table papers, your table pack. Um, sorry, no. Yeah, no, sorry, they're in the main. I, I think I think the only the, the only thing that the committee has and um, got at this stage is the SL one. So very happy to provide you with more detail on okay. the actual modifications to each set of of, of regulations and um, the guidance that will um, accompany and um, the regulations. We can get that to committee um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think that would be useful. And also, uh, Colin, it's for information. It's tab eight point one of the pack. Yeah, I, I was a bit worried that that's what it was because um, a point, and again, this isn't directed at our presenters, um, it's more directed at the executive. 
Um, we, we had an issue yesterday in, in, in my committee where we feel that there's a bit of a democratic deficit because already this has been presented today. It's about three or four pages, but it took nearly 15 or 16 minutes to detail all of the changes that there's going to be. And those changes could have significant impacts in this case on, on children and their lives. And we have members in the, um, the, in, in the actual room that were using language that I didn't quite grasp what the changes were. But yet we're going to give our approval and then they're going to bypass the 21-day rule of laying it to implement the changes. Now, I know there is a need for it, but there is also an absolutely critical need for proper democratic processes as well. Um, and I think it is important that we get that list of of changes and that you know before I, I presume this has to go to the assembly to be officially approved um but by that stage it already have been implemented but maybe by that stage we'll actually have seen the list of what the changes are um but this is happening in different committees and i think it's just really important that we that we just do it right thank you sir okay thank you um i will i will go then to a uh, orlea Trying to remember the order. Um, Orlea Flynn, are you there, Orlea? Yes, here. Um, I've nothing to add, Chair, for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine, Orlea. And then, Pam, final word to you, if you have a question on this. Yeah, thank you, Colin. And um, thank Colin McGrath, actually, for his point. I think it's very valid, and I would support his um, call for that additional information. I think that's, it's really important going forward for any further changes as well, because obviously these are very... Um, difficult situations that we're, we're dealing with. In terms of um, questions, um, uh, there's significant worry about the um, around uh, domestic violence and domestic and sexual violence in the home, and obviously this could well be exacerbated with the current lockdown. Um, and children are not unaffected by that either, whether or not they are. Uh, physically involved in any type of uh, domestic or sexual violence, even witnessing that can be very uh, detrimental to their ongoing mental health issues. Is there anything in here around that scenario that is uh, taken into recognition that um, the children um, are very at risk of being affected by domestic and sexual violence, whether it's aimed at them personally or not? Okay, so not, nothing in the regulation specific um, to domestic violence, but, uh, but I have referred um, in response to an earlier question um, to ongoing um, work on the development of what we're calling a vulnerable children um, plan. Uh, and that, that plan will aim to do um, two things. It will aim to keep children as safe as we can possibly and um, keep them and well um, within their own homes and secondly, um, safe and well um, within their um, communities. It will also um, identify what we consider to be um, more at-risk um, groups. Uh, and within um, that, certainly um, families um, where domestic violence is, is present uh, and children who are present in domestic violence um, households will be considered as a priority um, group um, within that plan. And, and hopefully we'll be able to share that with the committee um, in the not-too-distant um, future so you will have a sense of the kinds of actions that are being taken in response to um, that particular issue, because it is it is it is an issue, and it's an issue not only within Northern Ireland. It, it seems to be an issue um, across um, the UK, where there has been a, a rise in the number of domestic and um, violence uh, incidents as a result of people um, being um, behind um, closed doors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. And just finally, Chair. Um, can I just ask, following on from Paula Bradshaw's question, which I think is very good too, in terms of um, vulnerable children in the home um, and uh, the parents who have lost out very much on that external help and respite and all that goes with that, and, to, and indeed schooling, uh, for those with um, severe disabilities and learning difficulties and autism, you know, what is there? What is is there anything there additionally being put in place to actually help um, those parents cope with very challenging um, behaviours of um, children and adults? In fact, with with these conditions, um, get, you know, because this is a really it's a really difficult time when you're going from a, a full complement of services and help mechanisms in place 
to nothing overnight. And we've heard recent uh, examples through the media of um, families who, who are in that very stressful period of time. And it's not the fault of the parents at all um, in their parenting skills. It's, it's simply um, a fact that some individuals are, are very, very difficult to deal with, um, for one or two people to deal with in, an, in an, uh, a normal you know, environment. So is there, is there anything there additionally in, or is there anything coming in terms of help for those families who so desperately need help in order that their, their children um, don't harm themselves? Okay, so there's a couple of things too that, that I haven't um, referenced. Um, you know, the schools continue to be open for um, vulnerable children, and um, we've also um, indicated that daycare, likewise, um, daycare places should be um, provided um, for vulnerable children. And, and what, we're, what we're in the process of trying to do at the minute is to try and get as many children um, who are vulnerable into school or into daycare um, safely. I think and the emphasis has to be on on, on safe. Um, we close them um, for a reason. Um, we just can't put large numbers of children um, into school and, and daycare um, uh, settings then and, and, and place them um, at risk. You know, So that piece of work is uh, going on. Um, and again, we're working with the Department of Education on that. I did refer earlier to the other work that we're doing with the Department of Education around special schools, um, which have closed. And I refer to um, that arrangement that hopefully will be put in place um, soon, a multidisciplinary um, arrangement with all of the professional, the right professionals um, around the um, table who will undertake risk assessments on individual children. And if we can't get them into special schools, um, we will consider what other options are available um, to um, parents. Uh, the estimation at the minute is, and I don't know how accurate um, this is, that there are around 20 um, children um, who are in that position um, currently. So my expectation is that those risk assessments um, that I referred to by that multidisciplinary um, grouping um, will be undertaken um, quite quickly on those um, 20 um, children and hopefully effective alternative um, arrangements put in place. Okay, that's useful. And just in terms of, finally, in terms of when, you were, when we're referring to children in this scenario, what age does that take them up to? It doesn't take them to 18 or 19? Um, in terms of disabled children? Yes. Um, so it could be up to um, age 21 for um, a disabled child. Okay. okay. For a disabled person, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you, and I know just to reflect on, on Pam's point there, I know I have received significant concern from parents who are struggling in relation to the special schools and that. I also want to publicly um, acknowledge the, the risk that vulnerable people are at at the present time and to ask the public to rec remember that social services and those protective agencies are still operating. People should still report concerns, and anyone who needs help should reach out via child line or via the other, the other things that are in place, but just to emphasise the message that those services continue to operate, and it's vital that we all look out for and protect the vulnerable in our society. So, listen, I thank the panel for for presenting uh, here today, and uh, wish you all the best, and and thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, members, I should point out that this is subject to ne negative resolution, but it will come back as an SR. But I have to say, I do have a concern around the necessity for this, given that the surge hasn't been as bad as predicted. I'm not, I'm not sure if the rationale is safety or if the rationale is pressure on staff. Or So I do have a wee concern. Just This, is, this could have serious impact, in my view. I note from the position here that they say that Scott, Coronavirus Scotland Bill provision to make amendments to subordinate legislation England has also indicated that it is also currently considering whether to do likewise, and in the South it is saying that they are also considering legislation. So, I am um, not 100 per cent, to be honest, clear on the, on the rationale of the need for this. Events may have overtaken in a positive way, overtaken the need to do this, but I think this would have significant implications. What do members think? Jerry? Sure, I would agree with that. And also I know this is all coming in very quickly, but uh, can the committee take a, an approach where we reach out to CURS uh, advocacy groups to, to see their thoughts on this? Because I, I share Colin's point as well. I mean, there's a lot of detail in the presentation, some of which is still 
process in my mind, but the pack, and I'm not having to go with anybody, I'm saying the pack was limited in terms of the paper, so I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable making a decision today. Um, members on the phone, any indication or anybody want to make a... Chair, uh, yeah? Chair can I just ask, maybe, um, if the clerk could advise us on, on time scales and whether we have extra time to consider and um, maybe await that additional detail? Yeah, so, um, as the Chair said, this is being done by negative resolution. What that means is that in the normal run of events, if the committee were to approve the SL1, then the SR would be laid, and then the clock starts ticking um, during the period um, for consideration uh, before it, um, uh, the statutory period expires, um, and the committee could, um, during its next formal consideration, decide to um, seek to annul the regulations in the chamber when they come. Um, so there's a uh, period um, 30 day or 10 sitting day limit on that consideration so there is still time for the committee to vote against it um, when it comes formally. Um, in other cases in terms of the coronavirus regulations they have been laid sometimes without an SL1 being brought to the committee um, so it's possible that, um, that that could go ahead I imagine. Um, but the committee would still retain the power ultimately to take its own soundings on this matter and to come to a view in due course whether or not it approved the SL1 or not today. So could we, could we allow it to go forward as an SR but then take the additional information which we have been offered and take, a, take an, an additional view but allow the process to continue for now? Or do members I, would members feel that's appropriate? Yeah. Give us more time to consider, and maybe give us more time to maybe even in writing seek some views from some of the, some of the sector. Yeah. Yes, Pam, go ahead there. Yeah, chair, I think that would be appropriate. I mean, we don't want to be uh, unnecessarily blocking anything or or being obstructive, but to get that additional information would be good, and I think it, you know time allows us to do that. I think that would be the right course of action to, to let it. Go get the additional information. Um, there's still time to object if, if, if yeah. needs um, arise. Thank you, Pam. Paul, are you looking to agree? Yeah, I, I would agree with that course of action that Pam's just outlined, but I would also think that maybe when we're looking at our work forward work programme in a minute, that we could maybe use one of the evidence sessions to actually look at care and support for children during this pandemic. I think that there's a, there's a body of work there that we should be looking into. Okay. I would second that. Okay, so then, in, in light of that, then, are members content that the department makes the statutory rule? Content. Yeah, content. We'll reconsider then. Okay, thank you, members. So, I'm now going to return to our substantive, uh, in terms of our, our agenda, back to item three. Um, we had to curtail this in, in order to bring the presentations in. So, Chairperson's Business, members will be aware of the important message being flagged by GPs safeguarding board and others in terms of encouraging people to seek medical help when they need it and making the usual child protection calls where they have concerns. We have been retweeting these messages and I have been trying to increase circulation of that message throughout media opportunities and have re referenced it here today as well. I would also like to highlight that next week there is a one minute silence for deceased workers from COVID-19 or other work related causes on, being planned for Tuesday 28th of 11 a.m as part of Workers' Memorial Day, so I'm just flagging that to members as a, as a point of information. Um, I'll move on now to the draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of April, which are at tab 4.1 of your meeting pack? Are members content with the minutes? Content. content on the phone? Content. Yeah, thank you. Content. Matters arising then, I advise members that there are no matters arising from the minutes. So. We're now moving forward again to item page 10. Yep. So we're now moving to uh, correspondence. So turn to correspondence. Sorry, just before you move to correspondence, sorry, you mentioned there in your remarks about uh, trying to encourage people to go to the, the doctors if they have complaints and stuff. Yep. I, I think part of the problem at the moment, uh, and I'm saying this within my own family circle, that it, people seem to be, the worry is that they, they think GPs have, have, have suddenly disappeared into a bubble, yep. uh, and they're not sure how to penetrate that bubble, and they're, they're nearly frightened to pick the phone up. You know, And, and I, I, I just wonder maybe if, if the GPs really need to maybe explain 
better just exactly the way we're, they're, they're working, whether they're just taking, doing diagnostic stuff over the phone or whatever. But I, I just think there is this invisible barrier that has been created and people don't know how to yeah, I penetrate it. Yeah, I, th I think that is a point. I have seen, I have seen, saw some publicity from GPs over recent days addressing that. But I think the the message very much is, in emergency situations, or if you need to phone your GP, phone your GP. In relation to heart and stroke and those conditions where time is of the essence, people should present and they should continue to attend appointments that they have in place for those things. Um, and I think it's it's crucial that people. People do get that message that those services are still operating, and it's important that people look after their health in relation to those aspects, as well as the the, the dangers around COVID-19. So I think that's that's certainly worthwhile. Thank you, Alan. So turning to correspondence, can I refer members to the correspondence at tab nine of the pack and to the table papers and to the correspondence memo at tab nine point one? Can I firstly draw members' attention to several items? Item 9.4 is a draft response from the clerk to correspondence the committee has received regarding abortion. Are members content to approve the draft response? No, Chair, could I come in there? Yes, Pam. Yeah, I was just to say that you know they, the the draft response to, on abortion doesn't make any reference to the plethora of, of different different views on the topic within the committee. So, you know, I would um, really ask it. Um, Support be given to the inclusion of that or uh, reference to, you know, the the differing views on the topic. Uh, Paula. Um, uh, Chair, thank you. I, I'm aware that only three of the five trust areas are actually moving forward um, in terms of providing the service. So I suppose that the last line in the penultimate paragraph there will be legislated for across the whole country or across the five trust areas, because we can't have certain areas being disadvantaged. Okay, and um, in terms of th there was a decision taken and a vote on that issue in relation to that, Clark. Uh, what's your view on the on the uh, draft in relation to Palm's point? The, given the variety of views, the, the the draft was intended just to give a factual description of what has happened at committee, rather than to seek to enter into the discussion. So the drafts seeks to simply advise correspondence that the committee has sought legal advice, that we have sought research advice, um, that um, and what the committee's two decisions were at the previous meeting. Um, it's up to the committee to take proposals and make decisions on how it wishes to proceed, and of course I will seek to reflect that. Okay. Thank you. I think it's. I think. I think uh, we have. We have discussed and we have arrived at a factual position that's reflected in, in my view in the draft. And I think that the draft should be should be sent as as drafted. Chair, can I come back in there? Yes, Pam. Yeah, I mean, I don't see any. I don't see any harm. I think it is. It is factual to state that there is. You know, that there are differing views on the topic within the committee, uh, and I don't. Think, I don't see that as not being factual. To have that statement put into the draft. Yeah, well, I, I, I have no particular, I have no particular issue with that being included in that in that context. Yeah, I'm not saying that we go into what the different views are. I'm just saying that it is stated as a matter of fact that there are that there are differing views on the topic in the committee. Okay, I think that's fair enough, Jerry. Sure, I'd be happy to go ahead with as is. I mean, it says or at the start of the letter, there's deeply held views on this matter, and I think that's pretty you know, indicates that uh, the people do have divergent views. But I'd be generally happy with with going ahead with the letter. Well, could we amend that to say deeply held and differing views? Does that does that address it, Pam? So are we happy? Yeah, to... I th I think that would be very helpful. Okay, are, are we content to go ahead on that basis? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Item 9.16 is correspondence from the Committee for Justice regarding a proposal for a legislative consent memorandum for the Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Bill. <coughs> the LCM has since been laid in the Assembly on 20th April and is in the table papers at tab 9.17. Uh, it is my understanding that the debate on this LCM will take place on 12 May. As this bill impacts on some responsibilities of the Department of Health and contains provisions which could require the Department to allow the Secretary of State to make future regulations, members may wish to receive a, brief a briefing from the Department on the LCM, although we are not being formally consulted. So have members 
had a chance to consider that or take a view in terms of seeking a briefing from the department on that LCM? Yeah, a few indications that people think that would be useful. What about on the phone? We could seek. I, we, 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 let, I suppose we could, in the first instance, seek a written briefing, uh, and that may allow us more time to consider some of the other issues which are which are piling up, including the COVID nineteen. Um, so we could seek a written briefing, an oral briefing. Our, um, would would members be content that we seek a, writ a written briefing in the first instance and then consider? Yeah. 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 Happy on the phone. Okay. Okay. So uh, members are content to agree that. So moving on then to yep. So members are content that we seek a written briefing. Turning to table papers, then I draw members' attention to the following. Item nine point one eight is from the Elder Abuse Support Charity Arglass, raising concerns about funding and support for their work, which has increased during the current crisis. Are members content to forward that correspondence to the Department of Health and Department for Communities for consideration? Content. Thank yes, you. Sure. Item 9.19 is from an individual concerned about delays in breast screening services for patients already deemed to be at risk. Um, just to note that the Department's press release on suspension of screening programmes stated that higher risk breast screening will continue to be offered. So that's for members to note. Are members content to forward that correspondence to the Department of Health for a reply? Yep, content. content. Yep. Thank you. Item 9.20 is from an individual concerned about the closure of parks in the Armagh, Banbridge and Craigavon council area and the impact this is having on her autistic child. I note that ABC Council has since announced that that park will reopen. Are members content to reply to the individual, acknowledging, acknowledging that the park has reopened and informing her of the committee's ongoing engagement and correspondence on the challenge facing those with autism during this pandemic? Are members yeah. content? Yeah. Yeah. Chair, can I just come in there just for a second? Yes, just maybe, I don't know if we can um, add something in or just highlight again with the department. Obviously, I've written the department and I'd hope to have gotten that additional information or the additional guidance, Northern Ireland specific guidance around um, people with autism and the, the daily exercise, whether the clear guidance on, on how that can be operated on in Northern Ireland, whether that those um, excursions can be, you know, increased from the normal uh, guidelines. But so we're still waiting for that. So I think if if that was to come back, that would be useful for the individual as well to have. Uh, I don't know if the, the committee wants to actually prompt the department. Um, on that to, you know, to chase up where that Northern Ireland specific guidance is? Um, would we be within the time frame that we would have expected a reply to that, Clerk? No, I think that was only requested last week, um, so there would still be uh, within the 10 working days, but we can make uh, inquiries and see, and we can also make a note then to forward that to the individual when it comes. Yeah, yeah. So, so content to take that action along with the, uh, with the forwarding when it comes, Pam, yeah? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.21 is from a dentist concerning the financial payments to dentists, which do not appear to have taken account of individual circumstances during the test period used for the calculation of the payments. Um, I have written to the department in, in relation to this myself. Um, I think it's a significant issue. People who have been off on maternity leave appear to be uh, disadvantaged by the, the setup of the scheme. So would members be content to forward that to the Department of Health for a reply? Okay. Members yeah, content, thank you. Can. Item 9.22 is a copy of correspondence from an individual to a member concerning the financial pressure the coronavirus pandemic is placing on care homes at the present time. Members will recall this is a matter we raised with the department following the presentation to the committee by the care sector on 19th of March and followed up earlier with the Minister. I note the Department has recently said that it is looking into measures to provide further and uh, sorry, we have already followed up today with the Minister in relation to this issue. Um, I note the Department has recently said that it is looking into measures to provide further financial support for care homes to ensure stability and enable them to stay open, and the Minister has indicated that further today. I understand the member has already replied. Are members content to note and to continue our engagement with the Department on this issue? Members can talk to that. Thank you. So, forward work programme then. 
Sorry, Alice. Just to go back and check the now, so Oh, yeah, which. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I missed there on the way past members. I missed the correspondence member memo. Are members otherwise content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Content. Content. Yeah, thank you. So, forward work programme then. I uh, can refer members to the draft forward work programme at ten, tab 10.1 of the pack. And I can confirm that the committee actually there's been a sort of a, a positive development in terms of timing for committee meetings. The committee will be able to continue with our Thursday meetings as usual. I think that's in recognition of the significant work that we're involved in at the present time and the significant challenges that coronavirus is placing on, on the health. Um, so in terms of the forward work programme, then we have had a couple of, of indications today of things that we, we may need to try to work in over the next number of, of weeks. Um, the first one being in relation to yeah, budgets. Yeah, so we've, we've, we've moved forward with the budget. We've asked the Minister to come back to address further, further issues of concern. And we have also uh, indicated that we would like to engage with the children, the care, the care sector. Okay. Um, could that be done uh, effectively through a series of, or do we need to set up an evidence session for that, Ailish, or could we ask for views from the sector in writing? It's entirely up to the committee. Um, you're at liberty to seek written briefings um, and informal soundings, um, or if you then you wish to move directly to an evidence session, uh, we can of course seek to accommodate that. I just thought that the ladies you were presenting earlier, they obviously had a lot more information at their disposal. I thought there was so much to the, to the sector itself that we were trying to focus very much on the subject matter today, but I think a lot of our questions weren't necessarily that relevant to it. So I just think it's a the vulnerability of, of the age group. I think we should be trying to make sure that we are across the detail of the issues they're facing. And to, to get a presentation from, from the sector, would members agree with that? I think that would probably be the most, in that we can engage in it to and fro and, and you know, we can question and, and tease out the issues, I think, in more detail. So yes, I think we should. Um, there was, a, there was a, a suggestion from Colin, which I said I'd come back to in Forward Work Programme as well. What was that, Colin? Um, yes, sir, I suppose it's about the, the, the McGee College. Just there seems to be um, some conflicting information coming to the um, committee from, from the various people presenting. So if we could get whoever it is that's actually in charge of that process, either to give us a very significant written briefing um, or a short presentation, um, just so that we can find out exactly where it is, how much money is there, has the money going to be handed back, can it be rolled over, you know, just to get the actual picture of it. Yeah. Could we could we go with a written briefing in the first instance, and then we see how we take it on from there, Colin? Would that be? Yeah, and, and I think that's not a bad way to do things, Jerry. That if we get a written briefing, then we know what the deficit is, and then if we have to get a, 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 a an update briefing on on lots of issues, if we then know what we're getting the briefing on, we'll, they'll be giving a very specific presentation, and then the questions would probably be a bit shorter afterwards. So it might be a bad idea to do that for a lot of other um, presentations as well. Yeah. Well, for now we'll, we'll feed that we'll feed that into the system then. So that's a number of a number of things to be considered. So are members content to note the forward work program with those additions? Thank you. Yeah. So any other business then? Um, I have an item that I just want to raise uh, in relation to today's proceedings, but also previously we have asked for written information around the testing strategy and around a number of uh, the stock take things. I think the deadline for that was actually within was maybe the 20th, but that hasn't arrived as yet, Ailish, has it? The response to the stock taking? Anything, anything, we, anything we've received would go in tabled papers yeah. um, if it isn't received by the deadline, if it's of that nature related to COVID-19, anything urgent, anything the committee has specifically requested would, would go to you as soon as we get it, so no. Yeah, and I'm also concerned in relation to the, the advice that was referenced here today, that there was written advice which had been given to the department, but that uh, didn't appear to be readily available. I think we should ask for those documents to be provided now as a matter of urgency. Agreed. I agree with that, Chair, and just following the point um, on the medical evidence, something that I had wrote in an assembly question a while ago, and others have raised as well, so I would agree that we need to see that. Yeah. So understand in Order 48.2, which refers to Section 44 of the 1998 Act, I think we, we need to really ask for those documents to be provided. It's crucial in informing the next stage or further waves or stages of this epidemic. So, 
Okay. Uh, yeah, on Chair. the phone. Chair. Yes, uh, first of all, I had Colin there indicating. Yes, Chair. Just, um, it's because, remember, we had mentioned earlier about there not being enough time for the presentations, but I remember about three weeks ago, um, I didn't get to ask my questions because the minister couldn't hear me, and we agreed to send them off in writing, and I, I still haven't seen anything coming back as responses to those questions. Okay. Yeah, um, I can check the deadline on those for you and get back to you uh, in a moment. Okay, right. so we're, we're, the, the, we're looking for the testing strategy papers, the current stocks of PPE and the SAGE guidance. Yes, Pam, you were looking in there as well? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I'm really a wee bit concerned about the performance of the committee in terms of respecting um, those witnesses who are in front of the committee. And I think it's really vital that we do our business in a respectful and a well-mannered fashion. And I would question why, when most members present at the committee are respectful of the limited opportunity to ask questions, uh, that some members don't think that those limitations apply to them and don't even have the manners to go through the chair. And I think it's, I, I think some of what happened today was quite frankly rude and very disrespectful to both the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer. And I just want to put on record that um, that I, I don't think it's appropriate behaviour. I think the committee um, has not behaved like this um, in the past, and this is a recent um, progression. And I understand people are passionate on subjects and whatnot, but I think we have to be respectful uh, of the witnesses in front of us, no matter who they are. Um, and I think that we should give them time to answer the questions. But I also think that other that all the members need to be cognizant of the fact that we are all limited in the time that we have to answer questions. And you know, I could easily butt in two or three times after I ask my question too, but I choose not to out of respect, both for you, Chair, and for the committee process. Yeah, I think there are there are difficulties around people being on the phone and indicating. Obviously, people people in the room have have the ability to indicate. So there there are there are issues there. Um, I think that we need to maybe see if there's ways to if there's ways to improve improve how we're doing things. Um, Colin, your your questions. The due date for those was the twenty first of April, and the clerk has indicated that she will inquire as to the answer to those questions. I also have an indication now from Paula. Just to come back on Pam's point, I think that the clustering of the questions is, I'm finding it frustrating because we're getting one question or maybe one and a half questions and then they're taking them together. So we're not able to get back and that's why we're having to butt in. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact we can't put written questions down at the minute, we're not taking minister's questions and this, there is a communication fac vacuum. So if I offended Pam or anyone else today by butting in, it's because we're not getting a chance to come back and challenge the information that we're being given. Yeah, I think that is. I think that is just a second, Pam. I'll come back to you in a second. I think, and I have an indication from Jerry. I think, I think that is a part of the the issue. I think that is kind of driven by the fact we've had quite limited contact from the minister and his team. We have kind of agreed to give them as much space as possible. But there are issues of significant concern, which I think we need to. So I welcome his his uh, agreement that he will come back next week, and we can hopefully. Um, provide more time and space that we're not going over some of the some of the uh, the concerns that are out there on a recurring basis. Jerry, and then I'm coming back to you, Pam. Off from, from Paula's point, I mean, I'm sort of frustrated that questions are being asked and we don't have enough time to, to go through them. Generally speaking, I think it was about um, thirty odd minutes. Um, and not having to go to you, Chair, but when you finished your questions in terms of the your questions and then the minister's statements, so there's, there's a lot of sort of time being being. Um, Unnecessarily wasted at the start, and I think that can be weaned down so people can have more chance to ask questions. I mean, the job of this committee is to scrutinise, and I think that's what its role is to be done. People may not may not like certain aspects of scrutiny, but questions have to be asked. So I think we need to ensure this committee has all avenues possible to do that. Just generally speaking, on, on that point. Yeah, I think we do. We do absolutely need to find a way to provide that scrutiny. So I agree with you in relation to that, and um, in relation to brevity and and. Sometimes some of the interruptions are uh, an attempt to ensure that the, the actual questions are being answered rather than things being flagged up that, that the department rightly and understandably wish to flag up. But when we're in a question and answer session, I think it's important that, they, that they're focusing on the answers to the questions asked. Pam. 
Thank you, Sheriff. Let me come back in again. And I just wanted to make it very clear. I was in no way offended by by Paula. Um, when, when I talk about butting in, I mean, obviously, you know, when you're there in the committee, it's much easier to indicate that you want to come back in on, on a very specific issue and all the rest of it. So it is a it is a problem. It is a problem working remotely. I understand that. But what I'm what I'm referring to is I don't mind people coming back in. But what I'm saying is that most of us are respecting that, um, including Paula, is respecting that, and it's right to come back if your if your your question has not been answered. But but when it's done in a very continuous fashion, uh, and it's actually coming across as very. Um, well, very bad mannered, quite frankly, and 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 rude, and it almost feels like you're you're shouting over the witnesses in front of you. I think that's very poor, and that's what I I don't like uh, happening in, in the committee. Okay. Uh, Alan, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I sort of feel that uh, sometimes you know, you said it yourself there today that you know we are perfectly entitled as members of this committee to ask whatever questions we want. And nobody can dictate to us uh, what the questions uh, uh, should be, but I think sometimes, you know, I get a sense that we, we do spend um, a considerable amount of time, uh, maybe raking over things that are gone, uh, and that we can't change, uh, and, and are not going to be changed. Uh, and I think there will be a time. For that, there may well be a public inquiry at the end of all this as to, as to how it was, uh, the thing was handled, whether it was a good job, bad job, or there's lessons to be learned. And, and we, we, in a democracy, we welcome that. Uh, but I think really the, the, the job of the committee uh, should be the, the question about what's happening today, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's happening next week, as opposed to what happened two months ago or six weeks ago. Um, so I, th I think really that's maybe what we should as say we should be concentrating, and that's where we'll be doing a better service to the public we represent to, to, to really query what's happening today, why is it happening, and what's going to happen next. Just just my own thoughts on it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and, and again, that's noted. I suppose the concern would be that actually what happened a number of weeks ago could impact on what does happen next week, and we're seeking to try to learn those lessons, implement them under pressure of time, under pressure of people dealing with, with what's in front of them. But where there are lessons to be learned, or we don't have a long time to wait to look back, there is potentially a second wave of this coming at us quite quickly. So I think it's important that, that we balance that with having a real-time learning. You know, and and if, if mistakes are made or if things could be done better, then let's, let's try to find those out and, and move forward. So, members, um, I think that's that's uh, any other business completed, hopefully. And just then for time, date, time and place of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 30th of April 2020. Room to be confirmed. Thank you, members. Thanks. Thank you.